So the ideas shared in this workshop were developed on Bidjigal, Darawal, Gadigal, Morawina, Nanarwal, Wangal, Warren, sorry, Warrenjiri lands. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and recognise that sovereignty of these lands was never ceded. One of our speakers today too in the second session is based in New Orleans Turtle Island and will acknowledge the traditional owners of the country they're based on in their video in the creative session. So in this series of intersecting dialogues, we hope that everybody will feel uh, welcomed and challenged in thinking differently about menopause, uh, learning from uh, diverse perspectives, as we said, on this central topic. We really hope you can bring open minds um, and productive suggestions to this, uh, what we're hoping is a collective task of identifying some core principles for the development of a localised and inclusive sociology of menopause. Um, so uh, I'm sure you are all aware that we are in a fairly intensive time at the moment in thinking particularly about gender, but also about sexuality and reflecting on uh, some of the assumptions that we make about life course norms, what is considered to be kind of appropriate or healthy or expected ways of doing life. Um, there's a lot of complexity in thinking about and um, changing our thinking about some of those assumptions. And also there can be a lot of emotion in that. Uh, and I just want to, I guess, uh, make room for saying all perspectives are valued here today and all emotions. We've got some feelings work that will come up at a couple of points, um, but also this does need to be a space where we can discuss menopause experiences as they are lived in a range of different contexts. So that includes cisgender women, but also um, recognising menopause and other experiences of acute hormonal fluctuations are part of life course experiences of many other people, including trans people, non-binary people like myself, um, and that needs to be um, something that we're recognising and welcoming as part of the discussion today. All right. Uh, yes, I mean, I probably don't need to explicitly say this, but those expectations are quite clear. Um, uh, I do uh, hope that that's everyone's experience. Please let me know if there's uh, complicated stuff that comes up. Uh, we really want to hear um, all of the perspectives that are going to be useful for us in building um, this set of insights from today. So we've got three sessions. Uh, everybody who's online will contribute to most of that, um, but some of it will be a bit more of the in-person variety. The, we're starting with a focus on the social reimagining that's here. Then we're moving into another space. It is a space for social robotics work. So it's the National Facility for Human-Robot Interaction, which is just around the corner. Uh, then we're coming back here for the final session on clinical reimaginings. Uh, and then we're going for some drinks. If anybody would like to um, hang around for that, you're very, very welcome. And I'm going to hand over to Karen to introduce the next section. Great. All right. Um, so excited to be here. Thank you. Um, and I think I've got the best session because I've got the best speakers in mind. <laughs> So I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of context around this whole thing. So Christy and Catherine and I um, first got together and we started to talk about menopause because we were all having various experiences um, that related to our own personal journeys around the gender spectrum. Um, and one of the things that we sort of identified was that there was a real need for a sociology of menopause. Um, and we were united despite the differences of um, our embodied experiences um, that we we were fairly sure that the current social scripting around menopause was inadequate to capture our experiences. And we were sort of, we were fairly sure it was probably incapable of capturing the diversity of even cisgender heterosexual women's experiences, despite the kind of scripting around menopause. Um, so sociology, we thought, um, because a lot of us are sociologists, um, we felt that it could facilitate um, a way to sort of more expansively reimagine menopause that it could extend the knowledge of and then provide options for intervention into this largely cisgenderist and heterosexist domain of practice. So our aims on this project are threefold. First, we wanted to create a dedicated space for menopause to be reimagined through dialogue across diverse theoretical, empirical and embodied perspectives, and this is it today. 
We also wanted to explore these collective reimaginings in thinking differently about what a socially engaged design of health interventions that meets the needs of a more diversely imagined community of people experiencing menopause looks like. And that's, I think, where really Catherine's work is going to be like um, showcasing that. And then what we want to do with all this at the end is to sort of map areas of shared interest that can inform the development of a localised and inclusive sociology of menopause. So the question that we wanted to pose to all of you today is can menopause, menopause be reimagined beyond gender and sexuality norms? And so today I have the great privilege of chairing the first session on social reimaginings. Um, and we want to reflect on the way that uh, menopause is currently socially scripted and how we can intervene in its these kind of often static representations. So when putting together each of the sessions that we were each leading, we started with a provocation that we felt captured what we wanted to get out of the sessions um, and that we shared these provocations with our speakers. So the provocations that I put to the speakers in the first session was how can we reimagine menopause in biomedical, feminist and policy domains and how is an increased attention to menopause reshaping those fields? So now I'd like to introduce our three speakers for the first session. Would you all like to come up here to our... Beautiful I'm just going to do a quick intro. Um, okay, so the first speaker is Celia Roberts. Celia is a professor in the School of Sociology at ANU. And she's been working on menopause intermittently since the mid-1990s, but people no longer tell her that she's too young to do such research now. <laughs> Her research involves critical sociological analysis of scientific, biomedical and lay understandings of the biological processes, particularly those pertaining to sex, gender, reproduction and sexuality. Her books include Messengers of Sex, Hormones, Biomedicine and Feminisms, and Living Data, Making Sense of Biosensing. Um, I'm going to introduce all three speakers now because I'd, I'd like that conversation to continue um, as we go. Um, so the next speaker is Lucy Nicholas, um, pronouns they, them. Um, is an Associate Professor of Sociology and the Director of Gender and Sexualities Research at West, Western Sydney University. The research specialises in gender and sexuality, diver sorry, sexual diversities, men, masculinity and violence, social and political theory, queer theory, whiteness and feminisms. And then the final speaker of the session is Kylie Valentine. Uh, is, uh, Kylie is the Director of the Social Policy Research Centre and Centre for Social Research in Health both within the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture at UNSW Sydney. She's very interested in the sociology of knowledge and the history of ideas and how they can be used to understand social inequities. So let's start with Julia. Um, can you hear me? Yes, great. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really exciting to be here. And it's one of those lovely invitations you get where you think, oh, I could have written that myself. Um, this is... I really want to be part of this conversation. Um, so thank you for inviting me um, and just acknowledging on Gadigal country here uh, and that the work was undertaken on Nunawal country in uh, Canberra and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledging that this land was never ceded. Um, I want to really acknowledge my collaborators in the menopause thinking space um, because I have been working with lots of different people in different places, mostly unsuccessfully, I have to say, um, in terms of getting money. So in the UK, where I used to work, I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about menopause with Karen Throsby, uh, Vicky, Vicky Singleton, Louise Ann Wilson and Becky Fish. We tried for about six years to get a project uh, funded on this topic. So not to put a down or anything, but... Um, <laughs> Really, it was quite tricky and frustrating. Uh, but and more recently, working with Helen Keane, who's here, and Mary Lou Rasmussen, both uh, colleagues and mates at, uh, UN, at ANU. And, um, yeah, hoping to be more successful this time. We've just submitted a grant partially about menopause uh, to the ARC, so fingers crossed. Right, so I've been asked to talk about mobilising radical imaginaries uh, in biomedicine. <laughs> Um, and I'm not sure what those are, actually. Um, and I'm part of our ARC bid is to try and explore that. So it's like sort of three or four years early, this invitation. Um, so what I'm actually going to talk about, you know, maybe these things will come in, up in the final session, which will be great. 
But what I'm going to talk about is how I see the field at the moment and with that sort of hindsight view since when I first started working on this in my PhD in the 1990s um, and talk about where I think the tensions are and where that sort of gives you an indication of where we think Helen and Mary Lou and our group, are, if we get the money, we're going to look to pursue these radical imaginaries. So, so I've got five quick points to make. So that's like a minute on each. Um, so going to be speaking relatively bluntly and without a lot of detail to prove that what I'm saying is true. So I'm hoping that's not uh, difficult. But I am going to say, for starters, and these are provocations really, that I think the medical debates are quite stuck in a divisive disagreement that's quite polarised and around a kind of trope of the natural menopause versus the pharmaceutical or medicated menopause. And that leads to debates about menopause being either overtreated and that people should be left alone to get on with it or vastly undertreated. And I think about the debate that happened, was it March, when Martha Hickey published a whole series of articles in The Lancet and Susan Davis came back at her. And, you know, there's been a lot of really interesting uh, debate around that series of articles, um, which I and Helen and Mary Lou and I find extremely interesting because these are both very, very knowledgeable and smart women. I'm presuming both identify as feminists, both speaking what they believe to be the science, the good science, and they are saying entirely contradictory things. I think that's really interesting and quite unusual. Um, so that's one thing I want to say. Even a disagreement about the number of symptoms, right? So there's this really interesting thing about what gets to count as a symptom of menopause, you know, and the list can be seemingly endless. Um, or not, and Martha Hickey's come out saying, I don't understand why so many, why there are 200 symptoms of menopause and other people really wanting to add more to the list. So that's very controversial and interesting. My second point is about the significance of the Women's Health Initiative trial, which I think uh, I wrote about it in my book, uh, which that happened after my PhD, but the book took me seven years to write. So, um, and that was, as you all know, this huge uh, moment in the history of HRT where, you know, this trial showed that instead of reducing risk, various risk were increased, please don't ask me to go into the details, I can't remember them. Um, but there's been this really important role of that trial, both in what actually happened clinically, I mean, vast numbers of people stopped taking HRT, as it was then called, um, and you know, there was a whole change, I think, in what happened in clinics around that because of that trial. Since then, and in the last few years, obviously, there's been a revisiting of that trial and a revisiting of the decision to, not a revisiting of the decision, but a discussion of the decision to terminate that trial. And, you know, recent stats are saying there's a 60% rise in the UK um, of people, women, um, menopausal people taking um, hormones. Um, and you know, we're now looking at, we've just been researching this, this is a $20 billion US dollar industry globally. And as you know, there's been shortages in medication, etc. So there's this real, and I would love to have, I think someone should do what I would like to when, if I have time, is to really go back to that trial and think about what happened, think about how that's been discussed in the media and what really happened. Because again, I think there's a lot of controversy and a lot of quite fast and loose talking about what it means to terminate a trial and what it means to think about that in retrospect and what happened and why. I'm very interested and I don't know much about research, but I think it would be really interesting to think about what is the current role of the pharmaceutical companies in the return to the promotion of taking hormones at menopause. I think there's probably a lot going on there. Um, I'm not sure how you find out about that. My third point, and this is the point of the whole event here, and I'm totally on board with this, is I think there's a really important and interesting shift that has to happen and is kind of happening from the ground up around thinking about genderqueer people, uh, you know, trans people, gender diverse people, and also people who don't have, well, people who don't have children, have never had children or haven't had, they haven't birthed children, 
um, people with all sorts of disabilities, including learning disabilities, which was one group we were going to look at in our U UK project, people who've had cancer, had cancer treatment, people who don't have uteruses or ovaries. Um, all these people have been vastly understudied when it comes to menopausal transitions. And I like that phrase. I hadn't heard of that, acute hormonal transitions. Um, so a lot of the research, as you know, the clinical medical research is is based, doesn't take account of the existence of those people. And um, I think we've got a lot to learn from them, especially people who've been experimenting and using hormones for a really long time and know a lot about hormones. And we need to build on that knowledge and bring that into thinking about what menopause is and what might be best done about it. Um the other thing I want to say is I think it's really important for me as a feminist techno science studies scholar, STS scholar, to not think about medicine as a sort of shiny, white, clean space where doctors do things to people and provide expert opinion in this very controlled five-minute encounter. Medicine is happening all over the place. Um, and particularly on TikTok um, and in uh, popular books, shows. Helen and I had tickets to go and see Kaz Cook's new show, but it got cancelled in Canberra, so that was bad timing. Uh, her new book, It's the Menopause, she's doing a lot of radio stuff. Um, I've been looking at Mary Blair Haver. Yes. Uh, who's an extraordinary uh, figure who's an American um, obstetrician gynecologist who's written books about the menopause and is doing a lot of Instagram and et cetera. Um, so I think it's really important in terms of thinking sociologically about biomedicine to realise that it's m a really big and diverse field and that the national context, however, the national context still really matter. So what's happening in America is significantly different to the UK and Australia's always in that weird position of being a bit like both. So um, paying attention to uh, both, I mean, Kaz Cook is not a doctor, but she's give, there's a lot of medical information in that book. I've got the book uh, and a lot of medical advice. It's really interesting. How does a comedian end up doing that? Um, and how is a comedian different? Is Mary Claire Haver a performer or is she a doctor? You know, I'm not exactly sure. So those things are really uh, clear. She says the most extraordinary things, which I have a list. I can say them later. Um, finally, uh, and, uh, you know, preaching to the converted here, but I think it's really important and interesting to me that underneath all of these biomedical discussions, are ideas about sex and gender, right? Um, that they, that really old ideas, and that's what my earlier work was about, tracking through old ideas from the 19th century and through the 20th century, how they got built into hormonal science and hormonal medicine, how they got played out. And I think we're at this really important cultural, historical moment where these things are changing in really interesting ways. And I think it's really interesting to think about how menopause discourses both draw on and repeat seemingly endlessly those old ideas, but are also being challenged by contemporary changes. Um, and deeply connected to that is the way, which is where I started, where feminism is here. Um, because I think a lot of menopause discourse speaks on behalf of women in ways that um, those speakers would describe as feminist. <laughs> and I think as someone who's worked in feminism for a long time, I teach feminism, I feel very attached to it. I mean, Kylie and I did our PhDs in women's studies. You know, um, I just feel like there's this really difficult space now where I often hear things that are, people think are feminist and I have no connection to it and I deeply disagree with it. And I think what's ha I see that happening in the menopause space. So I think it's not clear. We are not in agreement <laughs> what a feminist take on this stuff is, and that it would be that we should be really careful about speaking as if we are in agreement. Um, and I'm not saying that people are not speaking. I don't think they're speaking in bad faith, but I think it would be really great not to have an assumption about what a feminist perspective on. Uh, 
hormones, menopause, et cetera, would be. And that's the sort of conversation I'm interested in having. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I too am a women's studies graduate and gender queer person. Uh, and that's just probably all I need to say for my bio and all of my work. Um, I can't stop wading into the these kind of polarizations in an attempt to find alternatives as well. And I think what you said about the polarizations is super compelling because I think it's a real, like you said, we're in a stuck moment with a lot of debates and I'm really fascinated in how we can move beyond those in ways that don't collapse back um, and aren't reinforcing really unpleasant ways of debating, talking and thinking. I think I see some really unpleasant behaviors um, that I hope we don't replicate today because we're all lovely. Um, so I'm definitely not an expert in menopause, but I am a person who thinks a lot and writes a lot about the social and political implications of degendering, um, degendering things in general. Um, and I'm also really interested in ideas about sex and gender that underpin a lot of the discourses around this. And I think what I really want to think about now is how we can navigate this current moment in thinking about gender and, and sex, um, so-called sex, without losing utopian thinking and without losing feminism. There is a way and it, things aren't mutually exclusive and I find that kind of zero sum thinking frustrating and boring. Um, so I'm also very excited about the title that you chose today about reimagining. Um, and I love what Karen said about, um, about that at the beginning. So I also do a lot of empirical work with non-binary and genderqueer people more recently because I feel like people are used as punching bags a lot and characterized and stereotyped in ways that don't represent the nuance of how people live and understand their genders. And that applies to cis people, trans people, genderqueer people. Um, it's, I just feel like they're used as objects of debate rather than real people. Um, and I've long been thinking about how we can do things, including gender better. That's been my whole like academic work, thinking about utopias without losing sight of current moments. Um, so I guess my jumping off point, I'm setting up a binary now, hilarious, um, is there's just all this, you all know, I'm sure, about all the media hype about degendering language in medical worlds um, to ostensibly to better include queer, trans, non-binary, intersex folks in discussions about what has historically been women's health, um, including menopause. And so at the most extreme opposition to this is, is arguments that it erases womanhood. <clears throat> that it, I can't believe I'm wading into this. I'm freaking terrified. Um, but at the most extreme end, it's this idea that it raises womanhood, right? So, and then you get, you know, right-wing media jumping on this and talking about the woke NHS in the UK or whatever, um, and really flattening the debates, reducing any middle ground, mocking it, using all those devices that that allow for it to be um, undermined effectively. And I know Karen has recently been writing about the practicalities of, I was looking for you up there. Ow. Um, the practicality, I'm sick, I've been sick. I'm better now, the symptoms have gone. Don't worry, I'm not here spreading, but I am still very tired. Um, I know you've written about take what I think is a fundamentally really undebatable, sensible approach of taking an additive approach to, to gendered language, um, which maintains the, you know, the, Yes, sorry, sure. So I think um, often the media talks about woke attempts to degender language around uh, women's health care, um, use terms like chest feeding or people with um, a uterus. There are people who suggest that there is a woke elite trying to um, degender all language and erase women, and that this is a really dangerous. Um, a dangerous phenomenon. And there are also people who argue that um, it's capitulating to um, anti-feminist discourse and that, for example, associating it with men's rights, with the men's rights approach of trying to degender language around men's violence, saying it's the same thing, um, equivocating those two things. Um, however, most proponents are actually 
proponents for additive language, so using breast and chest, for example. Even if that is the case, I think the way degendering is framed is very reductive and really problematic. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. I think there's kind of zero sum logic that's used in those debates. The kind of false binary that is pushed is between either binary difference or sameness and, and the idea that we lose our political capacity at, to be feminist if we degender language. I think sometimes it's a political cover for transphobia, but more generously read, I think it's a flawed feminist logic. Oh, I'm going hard, Jesus. Woo! Um, and also though, a lack of imagination. Um, and I think it really capitulates to a binary of, of like, we either have binary difference or sameness, and they're the only two choices. And I don't think they are the only two choices. And I think that underestimates people's capacities and imaginations. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about utopianism and realism, which has been a preoccupation of mine for a really long time as a gender queer women's studies graduate. Um, so, you know, like in my PhD, which became a book, returning to my old work, um, I realized now that I was proposing exactly this. It was written before we had the language of non-binary, gender queer was emerging, and I remember how exciting that was. And I did propose in that book that not, not that we erase difference, but that we reduce how much significance we put on those differences and how much we put them into binaries and a shift in the public imaginary. So the things we currently code as sexed and gendered are not lumped together into two discrete species of being. And I just feel like that's really simple. And also what my students come to at the end of every time I deliver my gender unit without me even leading them there, I promise. I give them the whole spectrum of readings. Um, so it was really exciting for me when this kind of thing became available, when there became like cultural resources, academic discourses that helped us to be able to think this, feminist biologists and so on. Um, and thinking about how our social categories are imposed on much more multiplicitous bodies and senses of self. And I think feminists have rightly questioned the implications of this for a group that continues to be identified, defined as a real social group continues to be treated as a very real homogenous social group and that as a result continues to be the othered group against a neutral category of men. So we all know about medicine being entirely masculinized so that, that other types of bodies aren't able to be understood through the framework. But back to the example, um, I understand the caution of some thinkers and I know, for example, Michael Flood has discussed the way that men have called for degendering of language around men's violence with that false equivocation logic. But it feels like a straw person argument because I don't think they're the same thing. And I worry about losing some of the utopianism when we capitulate too far to this kind of fear. And we give up on trying to push human thought to go beyond one or the other. Um, we don't expect enough of people. I think a really good example of how we don't expect enough of people is that often I've noticed that I've been analyzing the arguments against gender neutral language in medicine. So I've been doing a little empirical paper analyzing that stuff. And a lot of the arguments are made using either migrant women or less educated women as a kind of uh, device to say that they can't be expected to understand the complexities of these crazy ideas that this Western elite have come up with. And I think that's really sad. I think that's imposing assumptions about people. In doing interviews with both cisgender queer women and non-binary and gender queer people, they are from the full socioeconomic and migrant spectrum. They have very nuanced understandings of gender beyond any of the typologies that are trying to be imposed upon them. And I think it's a real sad, a sad logic. I think it's also a real shame to lock ourselves back into and capitulate back into the, the social world and the gender structure as it is. Also, which is against the wishes of increasing numbers of people who wish to be understood and exist and understand the world outside of it. It's a shame. Um, so, you know, people, feminists have long argued that it's actually the binary of biological sex that keeps us in the trap, because as soon as we have a binary, we have a hierarchy. That's not a novel argument at all, but I think I just want to bring it up all the time. Um, and it's been written about exhaustively by feminist philosophers, anthropologists, sociologists, um, biologists. 
Um, so I guess what I want to talk about is like what I want to end with is that in my empirical research with people, I'm consistently amazed and impressed by people's capacity to sit with complexity. And I think we need to honor respect and be inspired by that in this reimagining forward. People aren't actually dumb. Um, people from low socioeconomic groups who aren't professors at unis are unable to deal with this. Um, so, you know, I think I'm I'm always trying to be that person that's like, come on, let's all just get along. Um, and of course we don't want to bolt too soon and negate the very real gender hierarchy that exists. And none of us want to do that. And I think that's such an unpleasant mischaracterization of proponents of gender neutrality and degendering. But in reality, it's not actually what any of us have ever asked for, what any non-binary gender queer people have really ever asked for. Non-binary doesn't lose sight of the problems of male supremacy. And no people that I interviewed across all of my projects have ever not identified as feminists. Um, but it asks us to think about what a better, less gendered, but more multiplicitous world might look like. And I think that that's what we can all do today, together. <laughs>
Celia said she was going to speak bluntly and then was incredibly sophisticated as usual. I am going to be speaking pretty bluntly. Um, I, I don't want to um, at any point say like people are stupid and like what a stupid thing to say. Like part of the reason why that rhetorical um, discussion about women at the height of their powers and potential CEOs going missing from the workplace is because that's how you get things happening in policy like there does need to be an economic argument there is an expenditure review committee policy discussions don't happen because people think that it's nice um so so there are reasons for this um uh and um part of the sort of findings which i'll just talk about a little bit were, were about those sorts of things about like maintaining um, and supporting women to stay in the workplace, uh, people who have menopause in the workplace, um, because policy hasn't supported it. And an implicit and a sometimes explicit part of this discussion is that there has been a silence and a sort of shame and that menopause has been invisible and what we are doing now with policy is bringing this historically invisible silenced thing to the to the forefront um, that the shame and stigma surrounding menopause which has made it invisible is being addressed by these kind of new conversations and what happens fairly quickly in the wake of this is discussion about the um, narrowness of the conversation so um, uh, particularly the, the conversation seems to run that this is privileging a particular type of cis middle-class white woman who's working in an office um, who has a particular kind of work pattern, particular kind of work practice, um, and that uh, in, in sort of making it visible, making it um, a policy problem, we are sort of privileging people who are already privileged and we're not seeing, we're not recognising um, all of these other, all of these kind of other work practices. Um, so in the um, in in the parliamentary inquiry that I mentioned before, um, one of the the transcripts kind of say, we know nothing about how women of different racial or ethnic origins might experience the conjunction between menopause and work. We know nothing about trans women. We know nothing about women who identify as anything other than heterosexual. We know nothing about women in the gig economy. Really, the majority of the research that focuses on the workplace is about professional or managerial white middle-class able-bodied women. Um, and clearly what's also going on there is a particular type of model of menopause. Um, so there is a particular type of um, menopause that is imagined experience being made visible through these discussions. Um, and what I want to suggest is probably what is is already really obvious <laughs> to everybody, which is that we should both um, emphasize and amplify these discussions um, and also trouble them. So um, it is, I think, a really good thing that menopause is being discussed as a workplace issue. It is a really good thing that menopause is being discussed as something uh, that is the responsibility of uh, governments, organisations, policy advocates, um, you know, institutions rather than individuals. So I'm not doing that um, kind of critical thing of saying, you tell me something that you think is good and I'll tell you all the reasons why it's bad. Like I'm not trying to say, you know, like this is this is something that everybody thinks is good and, uh, you know, whoa, I am here, the kind of critical scholar to tell you that it's wrong. Um, I do think it's a good thing, but I also think um, that as well as the risks that people have already identified, which is the amplification and um, normalisation of a particular type of person having a particular type of menopause, there are also um, things that get misrep misrepresented um, and uh are just not not true and that there are kind of risks to telling this story that is a, a story that kind of mimics other things that have gone on so um one of the one of the kind of um analogs for this or one of the precedents for this 
uh, could be thought of as domestic violence entitlements in industrial in instruments. So for a while, um, and, and now in the kind of national standards, there has been a provision in some enterprise agreements for people who have experienced domestic violence to have specific leave, um, and that was uh, brought about, justified for things like going to courts, going to um, medical appointments. Um, and again, this is uncontrovertedly a, a, a good thing, partly because it does make it clear that workplaces have a responsibility for what happens um, to their employees, partly because um, things like courts and appointments are fine for people with flexible workplaces, but a lot of people don't have flexible workplaces, so they can't do a work at home day if they've got if they've got an appointment. So, so the the kind of making it an entitlement um, made it something that was uh, possible for people who otherwise it wouldn't be possible for. Now, of course, what happened, um, particularly when it be when it was becoming more widely talked about was that a whole lot of employer groups and industry groups said, no, don't do it. Um, and they said, don't do it, not again, not because they're bad, but because it's their job to like have as few limitations on employee rights as possible. Um, and the argument was either it's not needed, we're already doing that, you know, so it's just pushing it an open door, it's just a whole lot of bureaucracy that we don't need, or this will stop employers um, employing people who they think might be a risk for domestic violence. Um, I don't think either of those things are untrue, um, but it is a kind of argument against industrial um, instruments that are good. And it does, I think, kind of reinforce a kind of sense of people who are at risk of um, domestic violence. And, and we can think about this with pregnancy also, of course, and with the discussion about menopause. People who um, look to an employer like they may be making use of these um, industrial instruments to take leave to which they're entitled uh, are a risk because they're going to cost you more money than if you employ somebody who is either not going to go through menopause or has already gone through menopause. So there is this kind of sense of um, what you are what you are doing is taking a kind of vulnerable position and making it more vulnerable by making it um, making the person riskier um, for for public um, participation. I think that that's a really real conversation. I don't think it's um, a furphy. I also don't, I, I mean, I think it's nonsense as everybody does as well. I mean, if, and if that's the case, then, you know, like that's the problem. Like it's it's not that we shouldn't do it then because employers are dickheads and they won't employ people. It's like, well, that's, that's the actual problem. Um, nevertheless, I do think that there is a kind of sense of, um, as with um, uh, Celia's point about uh, menopause as being either something that's completely fine or completely medicalized if you have things like industrial agreements that make it sort of similar to sick leave um it does make it either something uh to which you are vulnerable in which case you need special provisions um or something that doesn't affect you in which case you know you're the model employee and you don't you know you don't need to worry um and this um, i'm talking about workplace but this extends to all kinds of public arenas as well this sense of people as being more vulnerable or more likely to call on entitlements if they're made um, if, if they're made available. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, and this is just, you know, like I think we're probably up to like the fifth generation of Foucauldian scholars here. So I don't think I don't think this will be um, this will be this will be startling. Um, but but there is we should always be suspicious as well when the policy conversation or is this is something that has been silenced and stigmatised and we are making it visible. We are articulating something that it was historically silenced because what, of course, that is doing is creating something that was historically silenced and is now making a noise or historically invisible and is now visible. Um, and, I th and, you know, clearly that's absolutely not true. Um, it is absolutely not true that menopause has been invisible. It might not have been visible in ways that were always helpful to people, um, but but as Lucy was saying about um, the com com capacity of um, people to sit with complexity and the capacity of complex ideas 
to exist in multiple spaces, the figure of the crone, the figure of the postmenopausal woman is is a completely visible, completely powerful historical symbolic figure and um, and something that's cross class, that's cross cultural. People have been making accommodations and sharing wisdom and strategies about this stuff forever. Um, and the idea that uh, that what we need is these kind of like policy, fairly blunt instruments, which everybody who works in policy will agree, policy is a fairly blunt instrument. Um, what we need is this in order to to kind of make it visible. Um, that's that's a narrative. Like that's not actually telling the truth. That's telling another story about menopause. And that story about menopause is something that is going to be, I think, increasingly circulating through the the kind of public sphere that as menopause has a moment what also has a moment is this sort of story that menopause is having a moment and up until this point nobody's known anything about it nobody's experienced it in complex ways nobody's you know negotiated the risks or the um or the kind of strengths of it um and i think that um as I said, there are risks to that, but it also is is also, and this is, you know, um, I'll finish with the kind of like um, researcher um, saying, it's fascinating, you know, like it, it is really fascinating the way that stories get told and the way that stories gets told as stories getting told for the first time. So I think the way that menopause is clearly already having um, some visibility as something that is not something that's experienced by women it's something experienced by people who have menopause and it's experienced in different ways and it doesn't necessarily mean grief and it doesn't necessarily mean celebration it doesn't necessarily mean anything it is diverse it's experienced in in diverse ways it reflects and produces new ways of having a sexed and hormonal body um, and that that is something that I think uh, is happening with menopause that that perhaps you know, with, with maternity leave, with domestic violence, with pregnancy, wasn't happening so much. So I think that that's something that the organisers of this event um, and everybody here should be really proud of. Um, and, and also it's it's a fascinating discussion. I'm so glad to um, to be a part of it. So thank you. All right. How are we going for time? Anyone keeping an eye on the... Oh my goodness me. Um, how do I make this move forward? No, no, no. Look, I just couldn't um, stop listening. So um, what we've done is I, I've given up trying to work technology, as you can see. I just <laughs> hand it over. Um, what we've set up is a Slido for people to add in the responses to these three questions. And I know that we've just now out of time, but Fear not, because we will be using everything that you add to this. This is this is part of our process of building this sociology of menopause. So um, for everyone here as well, take a screen grab or, or yeah. I'm so sorry. I thought this session finished at 1.40. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, and this, is the, this is the thing that Celia and I were just talking about um, uh, this morning. You know, we think about menopause as this singular life event that takes place when you reach a certain age and your hormones start going wonky and you stop menstruating and that's the end of your sexual citizenship and everything. And we keep talking about this is a long process. Um, it's not just a one-off event. And so I want to start thinking is, um, is, is one of the issues that we need to grapple with? Oh, far out. Um, what, <laughs> what are the issues that we need to start grappling with here? And I think that all three of you just beautifully laid out the complexity here of menopause you know but but if we were looking at the media representations we're all clamoring at the pharmacist screaming for our hrt amid you know shortages of patches and that we're all hysterical and oh my god like it's awful you know and speaking personally for me um menopause was actually a really affirming moment it wasn't a celebration because it was bloody awful but it was a really affirming moment so um this whole uh, lecture theatre is mic'd up, so you should be able to project and just and, and have it picked up. Um, I, we've only got 15 minutes, so I don't think we need to really go for the structured kind of sentence and answer thing. Who wants to just sort of um, reflect on, on what has just we've just heard from these three amazing speakers? And we've got Slido on, um, 
online as well. So please, for those online, um, please feel free to drop in a, a conversation. Oh, no, what happened? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I'm going to leave that. I, I mean, thank you so much. It's so interesting. Uh, I have a particular focus on ageing in my work. And I noticed that there wasn't really much mention of ageing in, in your discussions, even though ageing is clearly what's happening here <laughs> you know that 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 this happens at, that menopause occurs at particular points and I wouldn't say you know that I'm old um but that it's definitely a scene and that that image of the crone I was really grateful that you brought that in that I think we have these really old maps that actually do you know that that are there but I'm just wondering how you see aging as intersecting in this conversation because for me the fact that um, once we overlay aging and gender um, and the body, we get a really different compounding um, impact than if we than than if we just to take remove aging. So I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I think that's really interesting. Um, it's partly, I mean, speaking about what you call aging. I mean, I've also done quite a lot of work on older people and technologies of care and stuff. So. I mean, aging to me is like people in their 80s now. I mean, this is partly because this generation, you know, people are just living so long. So, you know, there's this weird thing about menopause that it's becoming, you know, the perimenopause. It's like the precondition. I think of Joe Dumit's work about the way in which all health conditions have now got a precondition and that's an opportunity to, to medicalise the thing before you've even got the thing, like pre-diabetes, whatever. So I, I have a so – my suspicious mind goes – we're just pushing it back and back and back. You know, we're going back to hormones forever kind of thing. Get them, start them when you hit puberty at eight and keep going until you die. Um, but I do also, so I think in a way, not so much about aging in the way that aging, I mean, therefore, if it's really the beginning of aging, we're aging for 50 years. Um, but on the other hand, I think absolutely that the horror that we still have culturally about ageing bodies is absolutely at play. And what really makes me feel incredibly rageful and <laughs> head spinningly is the way in which so called feminist books and media things really speak about female bodies, I'm going to use that word, they're talking about women mostly, but with such disgust and about ageing with such disgust and they deliberately provoke horror in us as people <laughs> that we should feel disgusted and horrified by sagging cheeks, you know, underarm fat. Um, you know, the talk about bones is just incredible. So there's this sort of idea that getting old is just in an inevitable hideous decline. I mean, the way that if you haven't looked at Mary Louise Haver, it is jaw dropping. Her hatred for the female, the older woman's body is just like, Oh my God. Like, I just can't, it's shocking to me that, that you can speak with such ageism actually. So I think it's totally part of it, but also um, kind of strangely, uh, I don't know, uh, not part of it. I, I, I think that's a really great question to think about. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, just to say absolutely yes, um, and and just two things. I think that um, when they when they when they look at this empirically, um, people report experiencing age discrimination in the workplace from, I don't know, 40s. Um, uh, and this, of course, is part of the discussion also about the gig economy because things like um, uh, um, sorry, Uber Eats and various other kinds of really unregulated, unsafe workplaces are open to people who are working longer or re-entering the workplace mm -hmm unintended um and so this is a kind of story about 
precarious work that is available when people may not have had access to regulated employment otherwise. So it's a very complicated and um, not happy story, but nevertheless complicated. Um, and so this, of course, is something that um, is uh, an overlay of uh, privilege and age and workplace entitlement. Um, and um, one of the, you know, one, one of the things about it, of course, is that um, the alternative to something like industrial agreements, which are kind of individual things where you, you know, you have a certain amount of leave and you can apply for it, is to extend and to apply universal design principles so that workplaces of all kinds are safe and comfortable for people who are going through menopause or not that are adjustable to people's needs. And, of course, the gig economy is the sort of last place that you're going to find that. So I don't want to sort of perpetuate the idea of, like, you know, these Amazon warehouses that are sort of repositories for all of the people who are, like, otherwise vulnerable and silenced and all the rest of it. But but I do think that there is a kind of real sense of the, um, the inequities of employment um, as they apply to older people, um, particularly older people who are working without sort of having any great joy or um, or or um, reward from it. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I think we can all agree then that the current representations of menopause are deficit, right? Okay, that's an obviously that's a bit of a duh um, question. Um, so how can we think about menopause more capaciously, more extensively, more, ex you know, in a, in a way that can accommodate diversity of experience and bodies and workplaces and, you know, how do we come up with a sociology of menopause that isn't a clinical do or die model, you know, of therapeutic intervention or just white knuckle through it because um, it'll be over in a, you know, in a day. <laughs> that's the idea right it's just it's like you reach this point in your life and you just go through it and then you're on the other side of it that's not what happens <laughs> hi I'm actually not going to answer that question but I'm Deborah Deborah Bateson so I'm a doctor I was medical director of family planning so I've been providing menopause care and training GPs and I'll talk about that later but I suppose I just wanted to comment on the diversity of menopause because there is that group of people that where it's not associated with age and of course, they have, you know, used to be called premature menopause, and then it got its name changed to premature ovarian insufficiency. Because, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, but you know, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a group that, you know, it really is stigmatizing and feeling that they don't fit anywhere. And I know people are working on this here, but it's, you know, I think that we have to include this group. And and again, I can know that GPs, you know, they feel scared enough about menopause per se but premature ovarian insufficiency terrifies people they just don't you know really don't have the tools to be able to talk about it or really know what to do about it so I just think it's a group that we really need to think about in this diversity yeah for 40, is that the... that's the official uh, timing yeah so early menopause 40 to 45 um, but before 40 and often it's it can be autoimmune or it can be surgically induced you know there's lots of reasons for it yeah, yeah, chemically, exactly. I think um, just drawing those two ideas together um, and I guess the, the reframing as um, hormonal flux, uh, I think a lot of the discussions around menopause are a loss. It's it's a loss of, of your prime. It's a loss of your ovarian function. Um, and I guess the other point in life that we have this significant change is puberty, and we see that as a gain. And so I do wonder if part of reframing and reshifting this is not focusing on um, the loss that comes with these hormonal changes, but the gain. And, and what is it about um, this change from perhaps one phase of your life to another that you gain during this period? And because it is inherently for most people connected with aging, seeing I think we as a society need to to shift our frame of reference that we're not all dying in our fifties, and that we have a, a long and happy life afterwards. And and what does this hormonal change bring about in terms of gains? Yeah, hundred percent. Oh, we get to 
Um, thank you for that. And thank you to everybody for this. It's really fascinating. And when you, what you said then about um, the loss of your ovarian function made me really think I am not at all concerned about potential loss of my ovarian function, but I am really worried about the loss of social status. And I realise when people talk about interventions in the workplace, I work between two places at my university and the idea of menopause being mentioned in one of those feels horrific to me. It feels like it is an, an automatic way of making a woman with hair my colour suddenly count for absolutely nothing. And in the other place where I work, it feels quite different. And possibly the difference is in the gender of the head of school. But this makes me wonder well, I mean, that, I mean, that sounds a little bit simplistic, doesn't it? But it does make me wonder whether in discussions with non-binary people and with trans people, whether there might, whether that might actually help to shift some of this, what I feel is this extreme misogyny, which is about the status of a woman being somehow, no matter what she does in the world, being linked to her potential fertility or something. Um, so anyway, anyway, that's just uh, kind of bit of a vomit of ideas, but thank thank you for inspiring it. Did you would like to respond to that? <laughs> I don't know. Do do people know the whale thing? Um I just think it's a really interesting thing to think with. So the the so called the other species that has menopause are certain kinds of whales, beluga whales, narwhals and orcas. Although they are now, there's some, there's an interesting thing about a group of chimpanzees just that they're starting to think, or maybe chimpanzees do. Anyway, um, and there's this really great, Karen Sorosby and I have written about this. Um, there was this particularly old orca whale um, living far up in Alaska or something. They called her Granny, the scientists. And their big question was, how could a, a postmenopausal female have any value at all? Right, that was the scientific question because they they could not understand in evolutionary terms. It doesn't make any sense. Like reproduce, that's what you're good for. So they studied these whales, um, and they found, which I absolutely love, this that actually postmenopausal whales um, are really fantastic and necessary to the survival of the pod because they um, they look after the younger ones and they teach the younger males how to have sex. So um, I just think this is real. <laughs> and they they take they do all this adventure stuff around finding food. They they do they have all I mean I'm not saying I'm not trying to animalize humans. I'm trying to think about how what do we think about the the social role of postmenopausal creatures are and that actually there's this you know probably many things that <laughs> people who don't who no longer menstruate actually can contribute to mm. society and if it's true for whales it's probably true for us too yeah I like that I think I'm gonna claim myself as a menopausal whale I think we've got a lot of I don't know, to I do I want to teach guys to have sex though no. yeah, I'll do that part no no and I just do all the other stuff yeah <laughs> yeah um look we're just about to um head to the break um so don't forget please have you got thoughts that you haven't had a chance to think or uh, articulate Chuck them on the Slido because we're going to use it and we really want to hear from everyone. Um, I also just want to acknowledge um, uh, a couple of things that we need to say up front. Um, this was actually um, made possible by a small grant from Taza um, for the workshop bursary. Um, so we say thank you to our... Oh, Taza, sorry, is the Australian Sociological Association. Um, so if those sociologists of us probably know Taza. If not, it's quite a, a cool group anyway, and they give us money, so we like them a lot. Um, and also um, Sarah and Izzy um, are like, <laughs> their names should have, they, they, like they, they've run this whole thing. We just come along for the day and, you know, swan in and, and then they're the one that do all the hard work. So we've got a break um, uh, now. Um, so there's some food if you're feeling hangry and, you know, you want to sort of um, fill that void in your menopausal body of deficit and loss. Um, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and then we'll start the um, creative session in the next um, location. So please, Marie, tag them 
is uh, has family ties to the Virabai people and the Mid North Coast of New South Wales. She provides leadership, as many of you would know, to the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture as co associate dean Indigenous um, and as our Indigenous Science here, Professor, Associate Professor, Faculty of Art, Architecture and Design. So, with the background as co founder of Mugalan Performing Arts, Liz Marie researches Indigenous Performing Arts. Recently published a book on the rehearsal practices, this is the title of Indigenous Performing Arts, of Indigenous Women Theatre Makers, sorry, Australia, Aratoa, and Turtle Island. And she's received numerous awards for her research. As well, she has directed The Weekend in 2019, Sydney Festival, and Broken Glass, Black Mount Arts, and Sydney Festival in 2018, and produced Kuri Grass, a celebration of Black Queer performance for Sydney Game Lesbian Mardi Gras. Mugalan 2017 to 2020, and the visit is 2020, and worked as a dramaturge on various independent projects across the country. So, what's like? Ah, are they going to just go? Oh, that's all good. Yeah, yeah. So, could you introduce yourself a bit further or tell us about where you're from? Will we go to the next question? I know, it's going so smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> we do tech so well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with your research applies to Indigenous research methodologies from mm. the Indigenous women's standpoint mm. as a framework for investing, investigating the rehearsal practices of Maori, First Nations, and Aboriginal Australian women playwrights. Yeah. Could you tell us about your experience of being in those rehearsal rooms, observing and participating, and identifying insights? To share beyond those private spaces of the anime. Sure. Um, when we first caught up, um, I first of all like to acknowledge that we're on uh Gaysal country, I might expect. Cousins are in here, so speak. <laughs> um lots of cousins. Um and pay my respects to Elder Charles and present and to any Aboriginal people who might be here today. Um when we started this conversation, um uh one of the things was, oh, so how, what's, what's your, you know, research methodology, Indigenous research, what is it, how is it applied to the study of performing arts? And um, we just had a conversation uh, about, I don't know, what, what it means, what, what is Indigenous research, and, and it may not necessarily be the focus of this, this um, forum, but it kind of leads into um, approaches and, and, and how, how how you frame discussions, I guess. So I, I might just start with, you know, what is Indigenous research? It speaks to the position of Indigenous researchers. Um, it reflects our epistemologies, our ways of knowing, our ways of doing, and our ways of being, how we approach things, how we see things, and how we do things. It recognises um, that all knowledge is socially situated, partial and grounded in our subjectivities, and experiences everyday life and acknowledges local ways of engaging with Indigenous communities. I guess if we're talking about um, a women's standpoint, uh, which was kind of driven by Aileen Morton Robinson um, and Irene Watson, it talks about our experiences of women as culturally informed. So the way we see the world is culturally informed, what we do is culturally informed, and how we do it is culturally informed. So I guess when it comes to researching women um, theatre makers, um, for me it was, okay, well, let's have a look at um, what is it specifically about Aboriginal women um, theatre makers and how do they bring their experiences into, you know, creating stories for the stage. Um, and there's a lot of things, a lot of practices that first start off, and that is, you know, before we, we even have a conversation, we would, you know, I walked into this room and was like, oh, this room should be smoked before we even start this conversation because we're telling our stories on unceded lands. Um, so we've, you know, we might have started today with the smoking, which you all have experienced at some point being Australian women, um, or women who've been in those spaces. Uh, we make those spaces safe for our stories to be told. Um, and for people to feel safe to tell their stories. And that's that's always a beginning point. That's always where we start from um, in any conversation. 
Um, the second thing is we would acknowledge country, of course, which we've done. Uh, we may even invite elders to come in to give us permission to speak on their country, to tell um, our stories on their country. Um, and then it would be a matter of welcoming everybody into the space so that they feel safe to tell their stories um, in, the, in, in this place. And that, that's universal across uh, most Indigenous communities that I've um, had the pleasure of being on and in, in theatre spaces. And of course, theatre spaces are, are not neutral spaces. They're spaces that have inherently uh, historical connections, either to practice, to land, to the rooms that we work in. Um, you know, most of us don't tell stories on our country anymore. We tell stories in black boxes and rehearse in black spaces. Um, so how do we make those spaces, you know, um, alive and vibrant and us feeling connected? So we, we make our connections to the land um, historically, either through the elders we invite in, um, to tell us about this country, this land, what was happening here, um, and all, uh, yeah. It's fair up, Yeah. You've got some images in the next slide, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so now these images. Yeah. Okay, so the, so I, I, I did a study about um, Indigenous women's theatre practices, um, primarily because, uh, uh, I'm a woman, and, um, and the, and the the stories that I ended up uh, sitting in rehearsal and documenting were of women playwrights. And in all those spaces, the women were in those spaces, you know, dictating the, and telling cultural stories, telling their life stories, all of these, you know, most most of these stories are, are um, situated in the lives of the women playwrights. And some of them were directors and some of them were just in the space. So we've got the Frocks and the Freedom Fighters, which is a story about Aki and her daughter uh, living in the shadow of their very famous um, patriarch, Chicka Dixon, who was an activist in the um, 60s and 70s in Australia. Uh, the one to the, I guess, my right, uh, is of the Unplugging, which is uh, by an Anishabe playwright called Yvette Nolan. Um, and the one below is Sunset Road by, uh, uh, from Tower of the Productions, and that's Miria George, who's from Air Taylor. We go to the next slide. So I I'll just go back before we get sure, on to sure, this. Sure. So I kind of, kind of linking in today's themes, I guess, and in talking through, um, the experiences of, I guess, bringing women's stories to stage, uh, creating those safe spaces is really important. Through all of this, when the playwrights were telling their stories, um, they were very kind of emotional moments and it often uh, an emotional sharing, outpouring would happen. Um, and just making sure that those spaces are safe for everybody, I don't know, parents, whatever, picture, yeah. All right, that's the key. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, we're looking at an image here of menopause, the play. Yeah, yeah, I want to just do one more thing to before we get on to that. I just want to go back to some of the conversations that were happening before and some yeah, of the notes yeah. I was writing. And I noticed that, you know, I just feel a little bit like, um, talking back to the white woman here in this space a little because I felt like race was kind of mentioned in diversity but it wasn't necessarily um, uh, highlighted along with gender um, and, and also bringing culture into that conversation which is what some people were, were doing. And I just feel like there for us there's this triple shame um, around uh, uh, women's issues, I guess. There's a... Uh, and that that's because historically women black women's bodies were were oh, exploited um marginalized and um, exoticized um and so this triple shame is also kind of compounded with queer communities as well um this invisibility of queerness in historically 
um, documented about our culture. It just doesn't exist. Um, and so a lot of the work I did with Barugra was around um, normalising queerness in communities. So recently we went to Barwarana uh, and we took Barugra to Barwarana and uh, Kuruga is just, look, it's a celebration of drag, really. Um, I tried to get uh, black queer performance up in, in some other forms, but it seems that drag was a very popular platform for, for many black queer artists. But the conversations I had in those communities um, with people coming up and saying how important it was that this was um, something that happened in this small town that where very little happened, because of this stigma, you know, that a lot of them, well, a lot of a lot of queer people in those communities are shut down. They're meant to feel like they have to hide away. And um, making safe spaces for these conversations to happen is actually um, a form of suicide prevention. And a lot of um, the drag artists that I've worked with over the years have, have talked about um, how important it is um, to create spaces for these conversations to happen in our communities. And like I said, it, it's like our languages, our culture, you know, our ways of being have constantly been marginalised or, or made invisible. So, so reclaiming those spaces is, 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 is something that needs is, is kind of happening. Um, and I call it kind of a radical celebration of um, sparkling defiance. <laughs> um, by just going out there and going, okay, you know, let's normalise this in our community. Yeah. Okay. So now we can move on to our class. Um, no, thanks for that. Um, so, given our interest today in creative reimagining of menopause, we're thrilled to see Nazaree Dickinson's play yeah. "Goodbye Auntie Flo," which yeah. is what you're looking at on the screen. Which is—is is it still touring? Um, no, it's finished. Just finished. Just finished. Directed by Rachel Mazza. Yeah. So I'm just going to read out um, the blur for Auntie Flo. Meet Flo, the unwelcome auntie everyone complains about, but who we depend on for our existence. You would think we'd be proud of this magnificent figure, keeper of the divine feminine power, but we hide her away and talk about her in whispers, especially later on when she starts turning, turning up altogether, stops turning up altogether. This is her story, or is it? A hilarious play created by mob for mob, exploring the ups and downs of the most natural stage of anyone who bleeds. Life. Menopause. So could you tell us more about the play? Yeah, and I think before I even get to that again, coming back to those life stages of women, I think in our communities we do have um, like signposts or, yeah. or like you can go from auntie, you know, and maybe auntie is perimenopausal. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, you know, you kind of move into this auntie status. Um, and then they, we have, of course, we have elder. And, and it's not always um, uh, uh, stipulated that, you know, being an elder is someone who's post menopause, or, but generally you would say, oh, an elder is a senior person, a senior leader within a community. And I guess it's just, you know, there's a lot of assumptions made about how you become a senior person in your community. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what, and what contributions elders have, you know, that conversation we went back to, it's like, you know, the value is only in your in certain things. And it's like we've got a lot to learn from other cultures. We're still learning from other cultures. I know in First Nations cultures in, in Canada, in Turtle Island, um, they have a number of rituals for women um, uh, that they still practice um, from from when when you start bleeding to, to when you stop bleeding and after. You know, and, and they still celebrate those those milestones in women's lives in various ways. And they, of course, they embrace the crow. Um, she's she's an archetype of you know First Nations culture. Um, yeah, so I think sometimes, you know, in marginalising and making invisible other cultures, we've actually done that more broadly to to white culture generally. You know, this kind of neutralising white culture is not non-existent. Um, so that there aren't there aren't anywhere to go and look for in those cultures, you know, except in what fairy tales. Um, uh, and, and, and that's where our morals sit. And now, you know, we learn from our cultures from um, as children. And, and of course, there's you know complexities in those simple stories, like there is in any culture. Um, but that's where we learn our lessons about aging. 
Is that what Madison Connor's painting is about, do you think? Christy, if you want to turn over to that one. Thank you. So this painting was for Andy Flo, right? Yeah. Well, I don't, I, I mean, I just pretty much took that off what um, the website. Um, and I think, I, I don't know if anyone can read that. Do you want me to read it out to you? Or Yeah, okay. I'll read it out. Um, so uh, this is the transition through menopause is vastly different for everyone. However, due to our holistic view of health and well-being as Aboriginal people, menopause symptoms and management are viewed as a community response. We are not alone in our journeys, and through this image, I wanted to create a sense of community supporting a person's journey. I created an abstract person in the bottom of the left-hand corner out of three shapes. Their hair is blue and flows to the top right corner of the image. If you look closely at the three shapes, you will notice the person is leaning over, holding their legs and feeling alone. Though throughout their hair is the symbols of people, the upside down U shape. The people are family, community and support systems. These represent a wraparound support system for the person who is experiencing their transition through menopause. In the middle of the artwork, there are circles which represent the symbol of communities, and these are connected by more circles. If you look closely, you will see that this represents the shape of a uterus. There is nothing rarer nor more beautiful than a person with a uterus being unapologetically themselves, comfortable in their perfect imperfection. I guess the question is, can this also be said about a woman without a uterus? Thank you. Well, I find that painting really moving, and also the description is so great. I've got one more thing. Go for it. <laughs> just this thing that you think about, and I'm thinking, like, um, what if we didn't cover this all up with language? You know, we're constantly talking about it rather than experiencing it and sharing that experience through other ways. You know, and I'm thinking about you know, the practice of deep listening. Like how 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 how, I, how might we sit? In a in a in a way of deep listening with each other that that um, doesn't involve that is non-verbal because I think sometimes by talking a lot about things we actually miss a lot of things and that's something that I've been taught I guess over the years because I, I do talk too much sometimes <laughs> and I have been you know, told to just shut that down a bit and but but it does make me think in the other way okay then. Then what might we learn by not talking about this too much? Yeah. You want me to shut up? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We've got more last question. Sure, sure. Thank um, you. Thank you. Macon is an installation artist based in New Orleans Turtle Island who is exhibited around the world, including an invited residency with UNSW and the National Art School for Sydney World Pride. They create large, immersive, handmade installations that host extensive participatory programming through a queer and intersectional feminist lens, including one on one on menopause called the Pause Apothecary, which we'll hear about today in a pre recorded interview with Christy last month. Before I introduce myself, I just want to begin by acknowledging the land where I sit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Chitimacha people, um, known as Bulbancha, which means land of many tongues in Choctaw. This land was also an important trading hub for people from more than 40 different nations for thousands of years, um, including the Atacapa, Cadao, Choctaw, Homa, Natchez, Biloxi, and Tunica nations. Um, I pay my respect to all of these peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence on this land. Um, so that being said, um, I'm also going to go ahead and introduce myself. Sorry, I'm bouncing between different things on my computer. Um, so my name is Macon Reed, um, and essentially, um, Christy and I met at an installation that I did last year in Sydney. Um, that was called Eulogy for the Dyke Bar, and it's pretty exemplary of the kind of practice that I usually do, which is primarily based in um, installations, sculptural installations that basically serve as a site for different participatory programs and chances for people to kind of engage and meet each other around a topic. Um, so, so 
this is a, a basically an installation that I built um, after being commissioned by a group called Let's Talk Menopause, which is actually in the U.S. It's the first national nonprofit to address menopause to have ever existed. Um, and so a little bit of context for where we are in this country in terms of menopause. Um, I learned so much from doing this project. I didn't realize that um, no one to become a medical doctor in this country, you do not need at any point to study anything about menopause. And actually 80% of OBGYNs don't take any coursework on menopause. So Basically, what the pause apothecary is, is it's an imaginary pharmacy with all of these sort of pretend joke products about different things that, um, you know, people experience around menopause um, and the conversations around menopause. Um, a big piece of how I was working was with humor because, well, for one, I'm a nerd, like one of my Instagram handles is making dad jokes, which is like kind of like, I almost wanted to call this dad jokes upon the carry because it was just like a lot of those. Um, but also because um, so much of the time, these sort of topics are, are, are like either taboo and people don't talk about them. Um, people might have shame around talking about some of this stuff. And then in addition to that, people just have this stereotype of feminists as being, you know, angry and serious and not fun. And I feel like this is something I, I consistently use in my work is you'll see these sort of really bright colors. That palette goes across almost everything I do. And I work with a lot of heavy subjects. And I think what it does is it kind of, it creates this little dissonance where people kind of have this response physically to these bright colors before their brains can kind of even come on. I thought I would start with this, um, this you know, joke product, pretend product. Um, which, you know, it says menopause is non-binary. And this was really important to me from the beginning. So, so for transparency's sake, the, the people in the organization that commissioned this project were all heterosexual, cisgender, white women. Um, and so, you know, we had, a, had to have a lot of conversations ahead of time around how they were understanding gender, how they were understanding menopause in the conversation. Um, and that in itself, I think, is often part of the work that I do in my projects. There's all this relational work and conversation that's happening before we even get to the point where I make something. So um, I'm, I just really was like, it's very important to me that um, that this is a queered version of the conversation around menopause. I'm really interested in how so menopause is gendered healthcare, right? And therefore, it's under under researched and under supported. But it also connects so much to, you know, we've lost um, reproductive rights in this country in the last couple of years. We've lost the right to an abortion. Um, just more bills came through, making it harder for trans people to get gender affirming care. Um, and then there are a lot of people who I know that live with endometriosis, which is another really painful, difficult thing that's under research. So I, I was also just thinking about this in terms of instead of feeling like these are siloed issues to bring them together and say like, how can we build solidarity? How can we learn from each other? Um, so that, yeah, to bring menopause kind of into the fold of those gender healthcare conversations. The flashlight and the candle next to here are, um, that was, I was thinking about ways you could control your own lighting when you were being gaslit. So trying to point to the fact that so many people are having like you know, all sorts of different experiences in their bodies and they're being told that it doesn't have to do with menopause or that it's in their head. This is an emergency uninvisibility cloak um, addressing, you know, the, the feeling of being invisible. Um, I forgot addressing memory issues that come up for people sometimes. I think the overall feeling of most people that came through were just like, oh my God, thank God someone is actually talking about this, you know, whether it was because they were learning about their, their own body's future or something they had gone through. Um, the number of older women who came and spoke to me and said, you know, I went through this with just in complete isolation and I thought I was going crazy. And, and I'm so glad to see, you know, it was, that was, it was powerful. And it, it kind of catches people in a place where they're a little bit more open, because if you see something, even if you agree with it, but you've seen it <clears throat> represented the same way a million times, you can see it and go, oh, yeah, 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 I already know that thing, you know, even if you care about it, I've caught myself doing that. But if you present the, the information to people again in a way that like gets them to see it again, you know, in a new way, then I think they can be more open. So even though I personally identify as non-binary, there's a place called the Women's Studio Workshop in upstate New York here um, that's like also teetering between different places in gender and history. Um, but they have a an artist book residency. And I'm actually, I got invited to 
to go there this fall and I'll be making a book form of this project so that it can be dispersed more widely to more people. Um, so something I learned from the Dyke Bar project, which um, I just keep referring to, but it's because, you know, we have that in common, but also it's, it, that was such a seminal project in me figuring out how to do these other things. But um, I spent a lot of time in, in queer archives reading about um, things from, you know, from before and seeing so many queers fighting each other out around language, um, around like people being, I'm not a lesbian, I'm a dyke. No, I'm a dyke, not a lesbian. Like, you know, just, it was like, so I think that, you know, I'm going to sound like a, like a libertarian, like my dad or something, but like, you know, binary and non-binary is kind of the most binary language yet that we have, you know, you're one or the other in that. But I also know that it's carving out a space for something to be figured out that we can't quite know yet too. And so I think it's important. And I think with cis and trans, the, the thing that I've seen that's kind of dangerous and I think is part of what kind of causes some tough stuff sometimes is that when we start talking about people as cisgender or transgender, and those are like the two categories, you take cisgender women and men and you put them into one category. And that is so gaslighting for cisgender women. And I think that that is a piece of this conversation that, um, gets, it's like a little, it's just sprinkled into everything. And, and I, I remember something that struck me, which I feel like applies to this situation, um, is that as we're moving forward on all of these fronts at the same time, um, we're not like, we're not at an arrival point. We're always like going towards something. And inevitably that means we're going to be making mistakes and we're going to be using terms for periods of time that don't make sense later. Um, and we figure that out by kind of bumping into our in, into ourselves and each other around that. And so that understanding history and, and queer art, queer experience, menopause, all this stuff in a sort of larger arc of a conversation really shifts like the way that I go about having it. And the way that I can say that, for example, is like right now we're using even terms like cis and trans and binary and non-binary. To me, these are like they're things we're working out something that's really hard both to create in an imaginary space in our minds, like worlds that are not the ones that we've been trained in from birth and go back generations, but also, um, yeah, we're trying to understand and imagine new ways that we could be together. Thank you. Can I speak Please Kath Aubrey, um, who comes to us from Melbourne, down at Swinburne University, where um, Kath is Professor of Media and also an ARC Fellow leading the Digital and Data Literacy to Sexual Health Policy and Practice Research, 2022 to 2026. Her past projects have investigated young people's practices of digital self-representation and the role of user-generated media, including social networking platforms and dating apps in young people's formal and informal sexual learning, safety and wellbeing practices. Kath is also a chief investigator on the Swedish-Australian collaboration, Digital Sex Sexual Health, Design of Safety, Pleasure and Wellbeing in the LGBTQ plus communities, 2022 to 2025, really, really active. Kath's <laughs> recently co-authored books include Data for Social Good, Nonprofit Sector Data Projects 2023 and Everyday Data Cultures 2022. Kath and I first met in the year-long program titled Academic Women and Leadership in 2013 when she worked at UNSW, and we collaborated in 2016 on a selfie and social activism, a digital method symposium funded by here and the Ian Potter Foundation. So, Kat, would you like to come up here or would you like to speak from over there? Ah, uh, you know, I'm okay to, to sit here if I'm um, audible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Um, I don't think it makes any difference for <laughs> the camera. Yeah, um, so uh, I'm responding to prompts that. Uh, Catherine sent earlier, um, but also um, improvising a little bit based on what people have already um, talked about today. Um, so I was trained, uh, and, and I should say the prompts are basically prompts relating to methodology, but I'm going to speak a bit to some of the other things we've been talking about today as well. So um, I was trained in cultural studies. Um, I also did my PhD around the same time as Christy here. So this is a, a lovely like homecoming for me. Um, but uh, 
very much in the space of textual analysis um, and uh, very much in humanities traditions of looking at um, media representations and giving a kind of educated guess as to what I think is going on through a kind of um, gender and power lens. Um, I have moved, though, in my own practice to doing a lot of empirical work and a lot of um, work that involves interviewing or workshopping. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, Catherine has asked me to speak a little bit to that. Um, and, and, and now mostly I work in partnership with external organisations. So right now in our sexual health project, um, uh, we're working with ASHAM, the Association for Sexual Health Medicine, and NAPWA, the National Association of People Living with HIV. And the thing I'm very interested in is how people experience um, what might be broadly termed sexual health and well-being through everyday digital and data practices and how these practices intersect with formal health data practices. And when I say data, it might sound very abstract, but what I'm talking about are things like building your dating app profile and using drop-down menus to explain things like gender, sexuality, race in some cases, what you say, what you don't say um, about yourself and what it's possible to say or not say about yourself on some platforms, depending on what the drop-down menu allows you to say. Um, and then what happens behind the scenes on that tech platform, um, how you are in, how your, your, what you have put into the front-facing interface is interpreted behind the scenes through kind of algorithmic matching practices and so on and how you understand that and how that might work in parallel with the intake interview in a medical clinic or the taking of your sexual history where you are made legible to a health practitioner through their understanding of health research data, which is often interpreted through the lens of demogra demographic categories. Um, women over 50 are more likely to do this, or men under, well, are more likely to do this. And then Medicare processing, which is a kind of behind-the-scenes version where your doctor might accept that you are non-binary, but the health claim forms they have to fill in can only read you as a man or a woman. Um, so th th those are the kinds of, um, yeah, things I'm interested in right now in, in the current research. Um, and, and so in the past, we've, we've done creative workshops to understand what makes people potentially feel safer or less safer when using dating apps, for example, by rather than kind of probing for what is your subjective experience of the dating app, to invite people to create profiles for a friend that has lots of green flags in it or lots of red flags in it and then describe what it is about those profiles that, you know, the people in the workshop have a, you know, a shared cultural understanding around or would disagree around, you know, what makes this safer or less safe. So what what is it that makes you think that if someone wears sunglasses in their profile picture, they're dealing drugs? <laughs> like, you know, which is one of the things that we had an in-depth conversation about in one workshop. <laughs> so it's, it's still kind of cultural studies work, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's thinking about self-representation and the way we understand representations of others and that we do that through a cultural lens um, and that these are shared and we often have tacit understandings of how this works and that happens in everyday life as much as it happens in professional spaces. Um, yeah, so, and, and so in, in, the, in the realm of sex tech or menotech um, or femtech, which are all kind of emergent fields that are really interesting, I'm, I'm quite interested in the ways that um, both the audience-facing communication or that the marketing material explains the technologies and why we need it and what it's for. But I'm, I'm becoming increasingly interested in the industry side of that, where if you go to the, the Digital Health Festival, as I did last week for a couple of days, or the week before for a couple of days in Melbourne, and you listen to tech founders talking about their product or their interface, 
you hear a particular kind of narrative, which I, you could almost kind of break down into a formulaic way as personal subjective history. Yeah. Um, I am a woman in pain. I have endometriosis, whatever. Um, uh, catchphrase, women are not small men. We need more data about women. We need to la la la. And then find, you know, the way we need to collect this data is through this commercial platform um, that where, you pay for. yeah, that, <laughs> well, it's not just that you will pay for it. You might get it for free, but you will add your data altruistically um, to this pool because we need more data about women. Um, and, and you are contributing to the pool of knowledge. And look, we have a doctor on our team um, who assures you that this is a, you know, and, and I'm not saying that all this work is being done in bad faith. I, I'm kind of mindful of what, um, you know, Kylie said and, and the other speakers have said earlier about, you know, we're speaking in blunt terms, but I'm very interested in the ways that um, medicine and markets are converging yeah. in this space and how that links to our everyday experiences through the digital and again like I noticed the little kind of embarrassed titter when Kylie said I looked this up on the internet like and, and things like that interest me because like the internet is just everyday life you know I, if I talk to my friend it's on the internet like we haven't talked on the internet uh, well we haven't talked other than on the internet I like since I left you know yeah Instagram. seven yeah. years ago yeah yeah, like, yeah. so we we have only talked on the internet yeah. for seven years and that's yeah. You know, just been an ordinary part of us maintaining connection at a distance. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think it's very, it's very ordinary. It's a very every day, but it's it's a very interesting space. And um, you know, I appreciate that you put me on the creative panel because I don't think of myself as especially creative, but I I appreciate the um, affirmation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> got some questions we can try up on the screen for people online and people in the room. Are there any questions for the audience for the two panelists? Yes, Kyle. Uh, could you say a little bit more? <coughs> Sorry, could you say a little bit more about Venotech and Venotech and Sex and Tech? Yeah, so these are I mean, these are spaces and it's interesting, I only kind of have market um takes on this because it's only market discourse that really is circulating I'm, I'm working on a project that is funded to research sex tech right now um but there is not a whole lot of academic research into that field other than there's a lot of research around sex robots for whatever reason but but not so much about kind of banal sex tech um so it, it could mean anything from menstrual trackers to dating apps, to um, uh, Wi-Fi enabled sex toys, so vibrators where you have an app where you can pre-program the vibrations or you can connect with a partner at a distance so you control their vibrator from a distance. Um, a lot of experimentation with that during lockdowns. Um, <laughs> Or, or in, in, in our study, we're also kind of thinking about non-digital forms of sex tech where we're thinking about gender-affirming technologies, for example, like packers or binders as forms of sex tech. And there's a long history in science and technology studies of also thinking about things like condoms, for example, or syringes as, as sexual technologies or, or drugs, you know, that hormones as, as sexual technologies. So we're, we're thinking about that kind of in the broad way of thinking about sexuality and gender through a technological lens. Femtech is more of a clear market field where it's capital W, women's health, but tech. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a huge global market. Um, I can't tell whether it's a bubble or not. And this is why I'm really... I'm really it's all right. It's some yeah. of it, some... Oh, weird. Go see Christy. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so like Christy's voice from afar. So some, sometimes it's, um, it, it's, it's like the kind of um, other tech bubbles we've seen where the, the, the market discourse says, you know, it's 30, 300 million something worldwide. No, now it's 50 million worldwide. It's the next blue ocean of venture capital. It's, it's um, a really interesting space. Um, and medical researchers are very much kind of immersed and enmeshed in it. Um, 
and it, yeah, so so that's femte. Yeah, sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's not, but it's often around things like you know um, managing vaginismus through an app. You know that's femte. Yeah. Have you looked at menotech? So yeah, menotech is. An intersection of sex tech and femme tech. Well, I, I don't think it's a formal space, but it's what I'm calling. I love it. My greatest wish has been to be a men influencer, and now I am, and I'm <laughs> um, so the um, so in these spaces, increasingly there are apps to manage your menopause. Yeah. Um, I and and often they are like a a coaching service. Like I don't know if anyone has seen Center, which is Chris Hemsley's fitness app. But it's similar. It's like, you know, there's dietary coaching, there's fitness regimes, there's someone you can talk to. And and often what they offer is kind of a private forum where you can talk about their issues. And, you know, forums are fantastic, but many of us might already be on Reddit talking about our perimenopause or our menopause or, in my case, you know, the all-gender perimenopause Facebook group that, yeah. that Heather Corinna ran for, you know, for many years was where I was talking about this. Um so it's a kind of um, walled garden space where you bring together. And often the promise is like you will develop from this by using this tech, you'll have a dashboard where you can track and map your systems and you'll have data that your doctor can't disagree with or deny so you will escape the risks of gaslighting. Um, but we know, I mean, the last thing a GP wants to see in a 15-minute Medicare consult is your dashboard. Like, you know, <laughs> that is so, so even if these are co-designed with doctors, they're often very unpopular in the average consult, you know, for so th that's the tech anyway, I heard. That's the terrain. It's, it's a fa fascinating terrain. There's another you know, tech where you can push a button to let your friends and family know that you're having a hot flush. Because <laughs> <laughs> they need to know. Yeah. yeah. That's fine with that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
hour by hour your symptoms or yeah. whatever. Like you're using, you know, whoever has to pick the kid up from school has the phone. Like that's, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, the communities exactly. are wanting to do. No, that. no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They want to keep track of the kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are there any more questions? Yes. Another one, sorry. Okay. I was wondering if you could unpack what you mean by um, a communal response to menopause. In okay. Sorry. Um, I did slightly flow. Like, I, ha I, I did bring Nazarene have a chat with her, and she said, oh. That microphone's working. Yeah, that's good. And, um, I, and I wanted to make connections, so I went to a women's group. And um, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, that's when she decided that that was what she was going to write about. Um, so I, I've had a flu as well. Where is that other lady who's had the flu? And I just keep Shark running into being blanks. Yes. Um, I'm trying to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I guess for me then, when we're talking through this kind of deep listening, this approach to deep listening, what is that? How, how do we bring that practice into, you know, talking about menopause, I guess? And sometimes it might just be allowing yourself to be with other women who are going through that process and maybe express that in different ways and that, that are non-verbal. And that might be just by making something, yeah. um, creating something um, that, that for you helps you because not everyone can talk about it. I mean, we make this assumption that, you know, everyone has this verbal intelligence um, and, and has the language to talk about these complex experiences. I and everybody has. Um, so what are the other ways that we can make those connections for people to feel like they're expressing those experiences? I guess is what I was trying to refer to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a clinician researcher, so a primary care clinician by background, and really I've been working in the area of menopause and menopause management, as we call it sometimes, for, for, well, really probably since about 1997 when I started off as a clinician at, at family planning and then became a medical director. Um, and so I've been involved in providing uh, advice, information, uh, tr treatment approaches, etc., for management particularly of, of distressing symptoms that people uh, may experience. I've been involved in training uh, other GPs and nurses to provide uh, menopause care and I've been involved in research as well. My experience is living it. Um, didn't really know much about it before. It was never really talked about. Uh, I just knew of hot flushes. Um, I didn't really know of everything else that came along and it's been quite the journey of learning uh, from friends and then from medical professions and just hearing such contradicting advice or lack of knowledge. Um, mm. Yeah, and that's confusing in a time that's very confusing. As I have a long experience in feminist women's health um, and more recently in sexological body work, which is a hands-on body work and coaching practice around bodies and sex and well-being. And I'm also a postmenopausal cis queer woman, um, and I've I've done lots of work around menopause for others and myself, and seen a lot of changes over the the decades I've been in this kind of health work. My experience with menopause is probably a little unconventional in that I skipped it entirely. So I guess I was probably perimenopausal. Um, and, you know, the, the wonder of testosterone is see it to, to periods and um, took me a very long time to grow a beard, but that was, uh, you know, down the track. So sort of it was very gentle and slow and cumulative impact. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney and I work in cancer-related survivorship um, and um, psycho-oncology. Um, and so having said that, I guess my um, my perspective on menopause is that it's it's clearly very much um, a part of life for anyone that has a uterus. Um, I think the thing that really bothers me most is um, is the attitude or the perception that pain is something that just has to be put up with. Um, and and I think that's a, you know, across the board and I think particularly in the context of 
um, of women or people of, of you know different gender identities that that that, that is really something that's diminished that that they that their pain is not the same or it doesn't matter as much or it's not recognised or there's some other kind of psychological reason for it. And I think that that um, is one of the things that I think is really distressing and I think um, we're too quick to just say there's nothing, nothing to see here, nothing that we can do and it's actually more likely to be in your head than in your body. Um. So I am a 36-year-old non-binary person who is also a breast cancer survivor. I'm a breast cancer survivor and I'm in medical medical menopause as a part of my cancer treatment. Um, And I have, that's been, I've been in menopause for about a year and five months. They, the doctor sort of walks you through what what type of cancer you have and how far along it is and what the treatments are for your kind of cancer. And um, my cancer was hormone responsive. It was explained that I would be on anti-hormone medications for the next five to 10 years. And honestly, of out of the hardest medical appointment I've ever had in my life. That was, that was the big shocker. Um, I did not know that that was something that might happen to me. I didn't know that was part of cancer treatment and, um, yeah, that, that was the hardest thing. And I, I did actually say, you know, can I, do I, do I have to do this? I think what people present with is what, how am I going to ride these changes in my body? What's happening to my sense of confidence or my sense of libido, sex, enjoyment of sex, desire for sex? Do I see this as a transition that I can move through or is this a closing of a door? And that's, those are big questions when you're perhaps in your 50s, 40s, um, and and then the, for some people, there's a total surprise around some of the things that are happening with menopause. I know for myself, one of the strongest things that happened for me was this dramatic loss of confidence. Um, and I literally would be in a, I was in a management role in an organisation and I would have meetings and I would feel like I could not face my role in the meeting. It was totally out of character. I didn't know what to do about it. And I realised it was connected to this transition happening around menopause. Well, I might give a little bit of historical perspective because it is really important when we're looking at the clinical picture because we know that the first hormone therapy was developed for for management of menopausal symptoms in as actually in the 1960s. And it was really pushed often by male doctors actually for sort of retain, it was seen as a deficiency in retaining sort of femininity. Uh, high usage in the 1990s. Then there was a landmark trial in 2002 from the US, uh, which the outcome was that the harms outweighed the benefits of that trial. It was later found that the, it was a very skewed population. So we know that it's safe for, for most people now, but it caused a huge panic and a loss of confidence for, for doctors and nurses. So we've actually saw a decline, a great decline. I saw it at family planning with with many GPs just feeling that they absolutely lack confidence around uh, talking about menopause, about providing advice. And then, yeah, I suppose sitting with my specialist um, and I was nervous. I was nervous she would believe me. I was nervous I wouldn't get help because I was at a point where I, I'm struggling to function at work. I'm struggling to send simple emails that really should not be a problem but the confidence was just so low. So yeah, it was, um, it was, I was scared. I was nervous. And and she, she spoke to me and uh, said, well, your readings, your hormone levels are high. You actually, by looking at that would say you're probably not even in mer- perimenopause yet. You're telling me these are the symptoms over the last two years and they've ramped up a lot recently. I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm not looking at those results. So by what you're telling me and what you're feeling, yes, it's, you're, you're in perimenopause um, and what I'll do is talk you through the options then to how we can treat this 
In terms of discussion of menopause in a clinical context, uh, I would point to the complete absence of discussion. At, you know, at no point in my journey, uh, which was, you know, explicitly about what impacts hormones would have on my body, did anyone talk about uh, what uh, would otherwise be happening if I didn't start on the testosterone journey? So, again, I'd had several children. Um, it, it, there was just no discussion. I don't think I've even ever had a conversation with another trans mask person of my age around this stuff. And, you know, I think that also reflects a lack of... Uh, conversation in trans community around some of the intimate um, embodied details of our lives that often by the time we work it out, we just want to focus on getting on with, you know, having uh, a degree of mental health and employment and, uh, you know, the the outward focusing engagement rather than the, unless, unless there's problems, right? And I've been blessed in that, um, you know, I haven't had uh, problems other than a need for uh, you know, the minimum amount of routine screening that um, somebody my age would have. Um, people my age don't necessarily have an idea in the same way that I had no idea what it really means in terms of co like the constant fatigue and the like low lying just mental of menopause you look at a list of symptoms on a brochure or a you know a fact sheet and you go it's hard to know what like what that will feel like in your body um the main one being like bone and joint pain i in i'm in pain a lot of the time and for me, I often forget that there's a reason for that. And it's, and that reason is the medical menopause. I, um, I didn't have anyone really explain to me initially, um, a lot of the like sexual side effects and it was only through TikTok that I even found out about it or that it could be treated um, and that it didn't have to, to be that way. <laughs> it's in, been an interesting experience that often the best advice I've been able to find on having breast cancer, especially as a young person, is from TikTok. <laughs> I think like many things, it it's becoming part of um I'm going to say women's perspective that they can talk about issues that relate to them and menopause being one of them you know I go to to conferences now where um speakers of a certain age will get up and say well you know while they're in the middle of a talk and just you know mention that they're having a hot flush or a hot flash or whatever you want to call it and, and just really kind of normalizing it in that context but I think it takes a critical mass to do that I think we're there at the moment and people are more aware of it um, more open about it um, but I don't know that that necessarily has always carried through into interactions with patients and people who are seeking advice. So I think while, you know, I guess the kinds of people that I'm mixing with on a professional level are often very, um, you know, empowered, um, highly articulate, um, very confident people, um, I don't think that reflects the experience of the wider community. So, yeah, would love... Thank you again to all of those wonderful people for being so generous in sharing their stories. Um, they've all checked that, by the way, and we're happy for it to be shared today. So thank you for, for watching and, and listening. Um, I'd love to know, yes, uh, please add your your feelings words to the Slido. I'm gonna... Oh, goodness, sadness at the, at the centre. That's interesting. Sense of belonging, community, relatable, emotional urgency anticipatory anxiety <laughs> um affirmed
<laughs> so um, we do, if anybody, I'd love to hear, has anybody got anything that they could add to explain a word that they've put or something that you want to say about that? And if so, we need to use these all the time for people online to be able to hear. Anybody has anything? Yeah, Lucy, I'll be brave. I'll be an oversharer from the overparent generation. Thank you. I did two, which were affirmed because I felt like that bunch of people were so awesomely diverse and uh, relatable and thoughtful. But I also put a little overwhelmed, which I think someone else has described better as anticipatory anxiety, especially with those kind of narratives of like, you know, the mainstream medical uh, world is not necessarily going to be the place for you. So it's, it was affirming to know that other people have a kind of the forebears that I can probably rely on, but uh, overwhelming that I will have to encounter this. Mm -hmm. The thing that's not recognised, I think, really well is that chemical menopause isn't just like off and on. Every 28 days, like, you have fluctuations. Like, it's fucking awful. <laughs> Any other feelings? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you can still have the feelings. They're just, they're just, they're just hidden. Go back and, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, and I need to go back to work. <laughs> We're going to activate the next question. Um, you please just answer either of the next two questions with that one. It's fine. They don't need to be separated. But was there anything new in that? I'd really love to know because I think a lot of the stories in there are things that are quite familiar to me, partly through the community that I'm part of, thinking a lot about particularly trans and gender diverse perspectives on some of this stuff. Yeah, um, yep. hold on, hold on. The trans mask fellow was talking about not having a heads up on um, the feelings that to his body that um, menopause was going to produce. Um, I wonder now that he's further down that journey mm. that um, he's got better insights because of his experience in going through the um, menopausal feelings and that. And while um, there's a voice that perhaps could be helpful to listen to for other people who aren't trans mask or trans men to know that your initial feelings about going through the menopause and that might change over time, mm. the more experience that you have with it, the more lived experience that you have. Mm. And I think that was a very valuable insight. Thanks for showing it. Thank you. Yeah, one of my... Um, favorite questions at the moment for anybody who's having co clinical conversations around menopause is which hormones are your clinicians talking to you about? Um, because of course they're all kind of gendered assumptions around which hormones you might be interested in, which ones you may have had an experience with, which ones may be appropriate and so on. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's certainly it's, that's one of the areas where there's incredible diversity. So in some cases there's no assumptions for example, in um, somebody who's presenting as female, that they might not be interested in testosterone. That's become like much part more part of the the conversation more generally. Um, were you going to say something? No. no. Yeah, Celia. People tend to choose. It's really annoying. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks. I really like that as a whatever it's method called. method Broke, broken yes dialogue. no I really liked it and I it's obviously a lot of work but it was it really worked I think um I thought it was really great having the young person um and I felt that was really helpful to me to think sort of put myself in her shoes in some ways or their shoes and think how much how different it would be to be going through that and particularly as they said changes about sexuality as a young person as opposed to someone you know been in a partnership for 30 years and <laughs> yeah, exactly well there is it yeah um so I think there's a that was really great um and the other thing I just wanted to say is um because there was a discussion of pain which I've found a bit hard to understand with the sexology person can't remember um, their name Stella. Stella, Stella thank yep. you um and I just want to say just to maybe uh 
reassure some people as someone who had endometriosis like for a really long time and suffered a lot of pain menopause for me was like I always used to joke saying it's like you know the cripple being made to walk like I just found it so incredible to to be relieved of that pain Mm. and I think in some for some people Mm. it is an incredible I mean it's not a healing in a kind of health sense but it was literally like oh that stopped a release you know it's just this amazing thing and the whole change from the ups and downs to a much more uh, um, stable thank you see the words don't come but a stable energy thing like I didn't like it was real there's some really great things I'm not saying it's all great but I think it's real well, for me and just speak for me it, it was there's hugely significant positivities in this so just point that out um and we have some more videos to watch so I, I was, the on- well, yeah, it was, the on- it was a psycho-oncologist I'm the wrong person oh yeah, yeah I was, was thinking it wasn't, wasn't still yes, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry yes yeah yeah um, and Harriana is talking very much in the context of chemotherapy oh. and medical medical menopause, and and quite specific context there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I was I might wait until after the next videos, but I was just going to say for everyone who's feeling very apprehensive about seeing their doctors <laughs> that there is a lot of positive work going on. I mean, I, I I think I maybe even talk about it later on that for young doctors and nurses coming through, menopause seems like a very you know, it's not something that they can emote with at all. So they I did I think I I wasn't very keen on my quote which said it's very old people. So I think I did. but I do think that there's you know there are changes happening in, in medical schools, in nursing schools where it is you know it the way of teaching it is different. There there is there is hope, I suppose I want to say that there is a rethinking around how we actually do manage these these complex consultations and and recognise that range of diversity as well. So. I think we heard that a bit in M's story as well yeah. about feeling explicitly listened to, even when the kind of biometric data and so on didn't kind of fit the picture that they needed. So that was thank you for sharing that piece. Um, I'm going to move on to the next video if that's okay. And then we're going to, um, but yeah, keep on thinking of your feelings, words. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, so, in a clinical reimagining of menopause, it would be great if it were a topic of conversation that is just uh, more openly shared and, you know, in very general, broad education contexts. I think, um, you know, young, AFAB and non-binary people are now much better placed to talk about uh, menstrual health. And so, you know, that's very different to what I would experience in in my teenage years. And, you know, these are generational shifts too. They're they're things that if my mother wasn't comfortable to talk about it, then, you know, how do I learn to be comfortable enough to talk about these things with my kids, especially if I know very little, right? I mean, I think it's interesting around imagined you know, we do have some evidence around around menopause as well. But I think I think it's really true to say that you know it it, it isn't often inclusive care. Um, and I think that you know anyone with menopausal symptoms, regardless of of their background, who they are, they may be transgender people, you know, gender diverse people. I think you know anyone needs to be able to access information about menopause. It needs to start in with that health literacy around around menopause is is quite low in the community um and i have to say sometimes it's quite low amongst healthcare professionals as well i feel like it's the first time it has been talked about um but then i wonder is it because of the people i engage with you know who who do talk about these things me and my friends speak openly about not just menopause but but many many parts of life and i live obviously um in a world in the inner west which is lovely and people communicate and um you know i'm part of the obviously lgbtqi plus community and uh for me it's a safe community to talk about anything pretty much uh and i and i wonder how different that is if you're in the heterosexual world um i feel it's very different um from my experience like 30 years ago uh in that world it's not so it's not so, I guess, um, maybe safe to talk to people or your friends or your colleagues. I literally just speak openly. I stand in the kitchen at work and I talk about it and I don't care because I'm not making this a taboo subject and I need the people around me to hear me, whether that's, you know, 
whether you're non-binary, whether you're a male, whether you're female, however you identify, you're going to be part of this journey with someone, whether it's your boss, your mum, your aunt, your sister, like someone in your life will be on this. One of the things that I've I've found really interesting um, as uh, as someone who's managing younger people is the emergence of um, menstrual leave um, as part of our um, uh, I guess our, our some of our our personal leave that people can take. So it's different to sick leave, or I think it's an important thing for us to recognise and. Um, and acknowledge that there are people who have a really hard time with menstruation, whether that's, um, you know, right through their lifetime or, you know, through uh, as they go through menopause or, or not. Um, and that, that may just highlight to us that we need to do more research in this area and we need to work harder in supporting people. I mean, I get excited about how each generation will bring, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I get to say that. I get excited about how each generation might start to approach these transitions differently. Um, I hope that there's a change around people's sense of having a right to being a sexual being until they die um, and that medicine needs to catch up with that if it's a medical issue um, and that um, people need access to ways to learn about their body that is not just through talking people need access to touch they need access to coaching to be able to learn about their bodies to touch their own bodies to ask other people to touch them to change the way they have sex if they need to or to add or expand the way they have sex so I feel excited about whether there's new generations that will have a higher expectation around those things and I have, ex I have excitement around how, as I said, how queer um, people will inform this space because the more we are part of developing healthcare, the more we bring in diverse experiences and views, and that benefits everybody. The frustrating thing I find is that with healthcare, um, everything's incredibly siloed. Um, cancer doctors just talk about cancer my psych my ADHD psychiatrist always tries to talk about symptoms not considering the cancer my endocrinologist can't won't speak to ADHD or cancer and I feel like I just want them to all sit in a room together because I'm so frustrated of being given lots of competing advice and nothing that seems like it's going to actually help. Like... The two PhD candidates that I'm working with at the moment, both are medical oncologists, both largely treat breast cancer. One of them has, has a PhD project which is um, uh, focused on interventions for sleep. Um, after the breast cancer diagnosis and different types of strategies that help. Um, the other is looking at um, genitourinary symptoms of menopause after breast cancer. And, you know, for me, the most valuable thing that has come out of that is that there are a, a, a cohort of oncologists, of, you know, who treat breast cancer now who say every time someone, you know, walks through the door who's had a diagnosis of breast cancer follow up, they say, how's your sleep and how's your vagina? You know, that's that's a that's creating change and actually it's allowing people to say, yes, this is a big problem for me or it's not, um, while we work out what the potential solutions are. You know, I find th as somebody who's also a parent of a 15 and a 22 year old, I, I think that there's some really interesting shifts happening around uh, agency and autonomy for young people. And I don't think it's by any means uh widespread or shared but I feel that there's greater awareness of the value of centering lived experience and centering autonomy and agency and really uh, you know thinking through any of the complexity of these circumstances and going what does it mean for the individual in the system to be well informed and making choices on their own behalf and that's 
you know, just as relevant if relevant if you're 40 to 50 as it is if you're 14 to 25. Uh, if you feel like you have a sense of uh, capacity to monitor your well-being, you're far more likely to have positive mental health. You're far more likely to be engaging in community contexts with that sense of self-empowerment. You're far more likely to be able to self-advocate for what you need. And, you know, you'll have the space within yourself to think through what it is that you actually need. Imagining, I mean, for me, yeah, imagining what uh, what clinical care could look like. It's it's holistic. Uh, it's not just you know talking about um, about treatments, um, but it is recognizing where people are getting their information. Because the other thing I haven't mentioned actually, Christy, yet is around. There's a massive market. Uh, it's huge in the United States, very big in in the UK, and bigish here around sort of um, what we call bioidentical therapies, which seem very attractive. They've made up by compounding pharmacists. You sometimes have some blood tests or saliva tests to work out your personal hormonal profile, and then you're prescribed uh, these, you know, these, these mixtures of hormones, but they don't have safety data associated with them. There are cases that they can be associated with terrible outcomes like endometrial cancer if the balance of the hormones is not correct. And so again, there's just, and often as doctors were asked to prescribe, you know, fill in a script that people bring to us. Um, and I think there's just needs to be, there's actually going to be a menopause task force, a Senate inquiry soon, which is excellent. And then we need to ensure that it covers all the range of what people are experiencing about the information they're receiving. It may come up somewhere else, but I do feel this has been around since the 90s as well, but the there's a huge industry around menopause that um, has benefits because it means there's money and research and um, and in intellect going into it. And there's also um, pitfalls in that because there can be um, quick fixes or um, really expensive practitioners. I've accompanied a few friends along to practitioners where it's very, um, it's a very repetitive, you can tell that this is the same consultation that someone's getting over and over and then boom, it's four or $500. And I'm suspicious of that kind of industry that's not really dealing with the person sitting in front of them. Breast cancer is a very um, gendered cancer, gendered experience, everything's pink. Um, Everything is pink um, and it does feel very women focused. Um, I learned pretty quickly, I actually just stopped even talking about being non-binary, stopped using they, them pronouns, just kept using my legal name um, because it was easier to just compartmentalise the health stuff. I've had, um, had one clinician, like one nurse, ask me what my pronouns were out of, a, you know, a year, a year, nearly a year and a half of cancer treatment. And that's all. Um, yeah. It would, I think it would feel nice to have more people ask me what my pronouns are. Thank you everybody again for, um, for watching those, those videos. Um, would love to know again, any additional feelings? Were they different with this set, which was more about reimaginings? Um, from the last lot. So we've got, is that slider still open? Thank you. If we can add to that. And then I've just got a few, I guess, um, wrapping up type questions. And so we'll do the feeling stuff and then come back to those. Um, oh, we've got a number. <laughs>
we've got people on online as well who are also adding to this, which is great. I wrote a swear and it put it in numbers. No. Oh. <laughs> is that you? Interesting. <laughs> of course, that was Lucy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear if anybody has anything they can expand on from what those feelings were about. Um, these are the kinds of things I was hoping would happen from some of these stories. Um, I, they make me very emotional, I should say. It was a lot of crying for me in that editing. Um, partly because I care very deeply about people's clinical experiences being positive. Um, um, I agree, Christy. I was one of the people who said I feel overwhelmed. Um, it sounds like the current state is one in which people are, it, like, it, it's mandatory to advocate for yourself and to be the middleman, middle person um, between a bunch of um, clinical areas that aren't talking to one another and the person who is experiencing that is the one that is left behind that um, if you don't have community support or you don't have avenues through which to um, I guess have an outlet um, it's a very lonely isolating experience where the amount of personal work to be your own advocate is very overwhelming there's a lot of work to do Deb I don't want to put you too much on the spot but I'm wondering what that was like for you as well to watch and thank you again for contributing so that's a pleasure oh I think it's it's very um it's very emotional actually it's very it's very it's very moving to watch it and to understand that there are so many but this, this is here and now and people are not getting the care they need so that's a, you know it's a terrible thing and the siloed nature of what happens I mean I think Cariana actually had the most hope actually talking about mm. you know the doctors who are, the oncologists who are talking about vaginas and and sleep um, but I think we've got a long way to go but I I do also think there are things you know there are positive moves um, to join things up um, to think about having navigators to to help you know support people but you know these all cost money it's it's very competitive health budget for all of these things but I do feel that yeah I mean I feel I feel sad I mean I know that people really struggle with our health system mm. and you know family planning we could only go so far then we have to refer on to you know to the oncologist and we know that it doesn't join up so I think it's a it's a re, it's a reality but we have to do something about it. Um, one of the things I was just kind of mulling over, I get a bit perplexed about um, a, a, a session that is about, you know, clinical, and it, it feels really focused on the problems, the clinical is doctors and, you know, um, specialists. And, you know, it's kind of that real... It, it, I, I wonder what's happened to some of the forums I would go to in the 90s where you'd never have a forum without an alternative therapist, yeah. someone from different cultures talking about what therapies or, you know, and, and I don't mean therapies that you necessarily take, but what sort of, what kind of care or therapies that that the um, folk brought into their lives and so I was just kind of curious about where did that go where did you know like alternative therapies go hmm. my Facebooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh I just wanted to say a really obvious thing about how horrible it was to see that person just losing their identity you know being unable to express themselves because of you know the pink and the, the pressure to be this kind of conforming, you know, cis woman, not a non-binary person, I found that incredibly emotional and just, you know, shocking and appalling. Uh, Kylie's got something. Hi, 
And I'll just also say uh, um, this is the last um, question that we've got open. I uh, would love to hear from people, but also um, wonderful if you can share uh, something that you will take from today that has kind of struck um, and that, yeah, that you're interested in taking on. <laughs> Um, so this isn't going to be very well articulated, but I think one of the things that as a um, social policy researcher, um, I really learn a lot um, from community all the time. And I think the, the, the queer community um, is exemplary in that sense. And and what I'm thinking about, and I think Louise have talked about it earlier, um, I'm thinking particularly of women um, who need a high levels of um, personal care and for whom menstrual management is a real issue of um, autonomy throughout their life. And there is a sense, I think, for um, people who need high levels of personal care that menopause is something of a relief for their carers. The The sort of messiness of women is taken care of, um, that that we don't need to worry about the, the physical care so much, we don't need to worry about the pregnancy risk, that sort of sense of um, menopause is something that makes you sit down and shut up. And I think what's really um, what's really great from this is the sort of sense that that's not going to fly anymore um, and that menopause is not people exiting from care or people becoming tidy for people who are looking after them. Um, and I do think that uh, that people who work in areas that aren't as fantastic as the queer community have a sort of responsibility to kind of learn from what's happening in what we've learned from the, the videos and from today um, and thinking about how that um, will work for people who's, who, who are often um, not thought about in this space and who, for whom advocacy and policies has got different sort of implications. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing, like, it doesn't end, right? Like, um, I'm postmenopausal, but I have HRT implants annually. And I know when they're starting to expire and I go straight back into, like, the shit <laughs> until I find someone who can put one in me and make me level again. Um, so I don't think it's a – I don't know whether the wording of transition is that useful. I like the fluctuation mm. terminology because it just means it's, it's it doesn't have an end point necessarily. Yeah. That's my two cents. Anybody else? Let's see if we've got anybody online. Oh, yes. Postmenopause can offer a great opportunity for great sex. Yes. I absolutely took that from those videos. Um, I'm just thinking about how uh, that participant was talking about their gendered body uh, as opposed to their gender identity. And I think in the medical profession that's central is the gendered anatomy mm. not the gendered identity mm. in a lot of ways and so I think they do struggle to come to terms with how people identify mm. because they're not reading they're reading things in very different ways they're reading things anatomic anatomical that's, <laughs> that's why I sat here um <laughs> anatomically <laughs> um yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think um, what you were talking about. I, I think demonising the medical profession is is probably not helpful. Mm. Um, and that you know, recognising that there's a lot more education that has to take place, you know, uh, around identity, and including, you know, um, <laughs> racial identities, those types of things. And I think, yeah. I just think demonising isn't very helpful, but yeah. But you know, to, to understand points of view is is you know probably the way to start, and to go okay, well, you know, what needs to change there? Yeah. yeah. And the medical system is made by humans. We're all all humans interacting. Yeah. Um, I first wanted to make a quick comment about the 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 issue that you raised about alternative therapies, which I thought was a really interesting one, and. I feel like we're maybe in a moment of um, shock in 
recognizing some of the kind of profiteering and um, and false information that has happened in some of those industries, and it has probably shut down um, the openness to the fact that chances are there are still a number of alternative therapies that would be extremely helpful and productive for people experiencing, um, you know, hormonal fluctuations. But the fact of people being poisoned by black cohosh and people being sold, you know, sold extraordinary amounts of, of stuff and, you know, to no avail, um, I guess has kind of, and, you know, I, I guess I saw this through HIV as well, you know, people being sold, all of these things and just exploited. And we haven't found a way through that yet, I think. Mm. I think, uh, yeah, I think women still are, uh, sorry, uh, people who are going through menopause find whatever they need to find. So uh, we may not be talking about it as much as we talk about, you know, bio something, something, uh, hormones or, you know, implants, but it's still happening. Yeah. 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 I, and I, I also took from your point, which is a, it's a really useful challenge, Bernadette, to, you know, the, the framing and so on. Um, what is missing there is that sense. I think it's a little bit there, but that kind of cultures of care and connection that we know is how communities find ways to look after themselves and others like that is historically always what's happened but like where and how is that happening in in this space is a really interesting one and one of the yeah one of the one of the interests for me is looking at the different conversations happening around hormonal therapies in the trans community and then in the kind of menopause space which is really similar and yet often not interconnecting unless you are in community and having and hearing them happen you know um because it's that sort of yeah that that's one example of like the different ways people are sharing knowledge and you know creatively kind of practicing uh, different ideas um but yeah yeah I think it's it's a really good point yeah me and my trans bestie mate share the same um implant um script <laughs> yeah so I like little hormone twins <laughs> Um, yeah, on that point, I have a kind of very media and comms disciplinary um, reflection, which is both, you know, one of the things very clear from the stories we've seen here and, and the conversations throughout the day is both digital cultures and the professional cultures of medicine sometimes are very responsive and very nuanced and sometimes contain misinformation and disinformation um, or are outdated in particular ways. And I think in health conversations, and this is because I kind of am doing this tech work and tech work with health, reproductive and sexual health people, there's a notion that, you know, there's the, the myth fact binary, the medical people have the facts, TikTok is where the myths live. Um, and, you know, I, no dissing the person who said I need to make TikToks about gynecology to get, you know, the truth out there. But in fact, you know, often the most productive, useful space for people to develop self-advocacy and the vocabulary that they need to have the dialogue with the medical practitioner is through the comments section of the TikTok. Um, and I, I've just been doing interviews with 18 to 29 year olds about what they want medical practitioners to know about their digital practices. And they said, you know, we almost think that some of our health practitioners need a peer navigator to help them understand the richness of digital culture <laughs> and how we learn about our bodies and then our, you know, our understandings of the world through that space. So, you know, I, and I think um, increasingly community around all kinds of aspects of our health is found in digital culture. So I just want to wave the flag for, for that space and that, that interdisciplinary space. All right. You've heard it here first from the world's first menopluencer. Well, sorry, I just need to get on the TikTok. Yes. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I just wondered what people thought about the stigmatisation that happens when people are really open about being menopausal, if anyone's had that experience. Because no one's mentioned it and it hasn't come up on any of the... 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, if I did, I didn't pay attention to him. Mm -hmm. um, no, I just, I just crack on, and if they don't want to hear, then they walk away. And if I notice that, then I'll pull them back in. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just, I'm a bit of an overshare, I think. So, I think anyone who engages in conversation with finds out a lot more than they probably should. <laughs> um, but yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't so much in my conversations with people now. Yeah, I, I do. Like, I mean, I'm on Zoom all the time because I work remotely. And I'm always like, oh, my HIT is like wearing off. You know, I need to get my new implant. Like, just bear with me. I'm going to be like brain foggy and stuff. And then people like say, hey, can you like hang on to the call for a couple of minutes? And then they'll be like, okay, just through this shit. Like, what do you do? <laughs> you know, and so it does. Like talking about it and being open about it. And just, and also it's like a, um, a really good practice because it's like I'm not going to be at my best today because my hormones are fucked. I have done that too. Um, and then Mark, you, can get, you, you can get a lot of kickback, you know, really big time kickback. And no one's had that. Colleagues? Family? People, don't kick back. <laughs> um, my comment about stigma is more about internalised stigma that you actually – have about menopause like I want people to know that I'm genuinely angry when I'm angry I don't want someone to tell me that's a hormonal fluctuation I'm mad about that shit um and I guess I find myself policing whether it would be strategic for me to say well I could be having a bad day today I I, I don't I, I've worked hard to get to where my voice is, is here so I don't I don't want to cut undercut myself. So I guess I have to look at my own internalized menopause stigma. I have a very quick question for the organizers. Um, one is where does the language of acute hormonal fluctuation come from? Do we need to cite somebody? And two is those incredible freaking videos. Are you, what are you going to do with them? Are they going to become like public resources? Cause they were so cool. Did you find them useful? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the agreement with the people who've contributed is that we will include them in the recording that goes to people who've registered. But if we're going to make it public, I need to have a bit more of a think about it. Probably get somebody who actually knows how to edit to like, did, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But um, I agree. I'm very affected by all of those stories, there was so much more that I could have included as well. Um, and I do think there would be useful. So I'm, I, I will, I'll take that back and, and, and have a conversation. But as you can imagine, there was a lot in sharing that um, and it was designed just for this event. So, yeah, I will take it on board that. Thank you. In terms of the phrase, we, we came up with it in our conversation, but it must have been used by others. A, a, a bit. We were talking about it, trying to. Thanks, Izzy. Um, I think we were trying to talk about it because we're trying to link our diverse experiences, yes, yes. and and menopause wasn't going to be an accurate enough. Yes. And so we were just trying to play with words. Yes. Yeah. And there's that's right. Um, that it's not, it's not on the internet. I will quick patent it. <laughs> Trademark. Trademark. Um. Yeah. Okay. We need to quickly write a conversation article, and then you can all cite. You can all cite it. Um. I think it's important. I mean, it's a bit like, yeah, menop menopause itself has all this kind of cultural symbolism and it, you know, it, it, it is laden and is really useful in, in, in some ways, but um, yeah, that there's a whole lot of experiences that people may have that may not consider to be part of menopause. Yeah. Uh, was there somebody else? Yeah. Um, your question about uh, feeling stigmatized. I, I think it's also contextual. Like uh, I, my work was in um, women's health uh, in the 90s. Um, we talked about that stuff all the time. And so I'd never feel stigmatised. Then I moved to somewhere else and it wasn't, it wasn't part of the vernacular. It wasn't part of um, anyone's interest because it was a much, you know, younger group of people. It, it, and then, you know, now I work in um, aged care advocacy. So it's not really that a conversation there either so you know kind of it it the context of where we are in our lives and who what what we 
find really, you know, essential to talk about and fascinating to talk about shifts in our lives. And that that's a good thing, I think. Uh, and also I just wanted to say about the digital, uh, you know, like we didn't have that in the 90s. So, uh, uh, well, it, it's, it's much more a, a place that, if I was menopausal or wanting to have those conversations now, that's where I would go. And I would, you know, I'd probably do a bit of research about where I where I landed with that. But I just, I do think the context of where stigma happens is really different. We're going to wrap up this session. I just wanted to please, um, if you can all join me in thanking my wonderful video participants. So I'm very grateful for contributing to this session and uh, yeah, we can, we can wrap up now with some final comments from the conveners. I'd just like to say, thank you. It's been such a fabulous day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs> I don't know what to say. This was on my part. I didn't prepare for this. It's, your it's my, okay. Um, thank you so much to the Australian Sociological Association for their small grant for this workshop. Um, as you can see, there was a whole lot of um, questions in amongst what we were exploring, which we do consider central to sociological ways of thinking. Also, what I love about sociology is that they are important questions, I think, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And hopefully days like this are um, about showing that they are, we're finding ways to, to connect those conversations. So it's not just in university, not just in a healthcare setting, not just in a community setting and so on. Um, and thank you to these two wonderful people for helping put together what was a really, really interesting combination. We're all from the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture, all work in different areas, but it's a really great example of uh, a new, a new set of connections. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you to the School of Art and Design for hosting us here on this um, gorgeous campus. Love coming here. Yeah, um, you can all come to Kensington next time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you to Izzy. Yeah. And to Sarah for just a huge amount of work, despite the despite the poltergeist in the audio system. But um, you know, we we dealt with them. Um, and thank you everybody for turning up, contributing. Our speakers were incredible. All of you, I really learnt so much, and it was a really fantastic combination. So thanks everybody for for being here, and thanks everyone who has joined online as well. There will be a video recording that we'll send out um, once we've edited that. Um, does anybody have anything final that they wanted to add before we wrap up, or do you feel? Um, yep. Yeah. Um, just a huge thank you to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fantastic thank okay. you so much everybody 